Hey, what is up, everybody? So it is Jack here, and I am excited to be sharing with you today how you can create your own comic book series and self-publish. And I'm bringing to bear my many years of experience developing my own series. Um, I spent about 10 years uh, developing my series and have you know done so uh, successfully with a bunch of different uh, titles. And so I'm bringing to bear all that knowledge that I've accumulated over these past years so that you can actually uh, get started on your own series if you've always been wanting to do that. So we're going to be going through um, this uh, presentation here, and I'm going to be sharing with you the nuts and bolts and everything on the way up and even giving you further reference and reading if you want to take things to the next level, you know, beyond a smaller campaign. So we're, we're going to be going over a lot of things. It's going to be pretty comprehensive. So just buckle on up, uh, get some uh, water, get a notepad or a Word document so you can take notes for yourself. And we are going to uh, help you get your dreams into reality. So the uh, presentation here is for anybody uh, really who's trying to take their comic book idea and bring it to life. Um, anyone who wants to learn the basics you know, about Indiegogo, Kablam Services, those are kind of the main platforms we're going to be talking about. We're talking about crowdsource fundraising and publishing. Um, but there are some others that you know, we'll briefly mention as well if you're looking for alternatives. Um, if you're just curious about how to make a comic book you know, as an independent publisher, like maybe you're just testing the waters. Again, this is a great presentation to help you to feel it out if this is something for you. And anyone who's just curious about my own series, if you're wondering about my own series and my history, there's a little bit of that in there too. So again, anybody who's just curious about making their own comic book, bring it to life, self-publishing, and then people uh, you know, who might just be tangentially interested in my own comic book series, um, this is definitely a great presentation for you. And uh, just a quick note here that this uh, presentation is for informational purposes only. Um, it's not legal advice or investment advice. And there are issues, of course, when it comes to producing your own comic book series, there's going to be legal issues, there's going to be financial issues. Uh, but for those things, uh, you know, we just talk about those in generalities. And really, you're going to need to uh, seek out a professional um, if you need help for those needs. So just, just keep that in mind that there will be issues that come up when you're producing your own series that you will need professional help for. So a good question, of course, is why should you uh, listen to me? So as I was saying, I've been doing this for over 10 years at this point, and I myself didn't come from a background where I had lots of experience. I, I didn't work in a major publishing house. I don't come from a family that did comic books or anything like that. Um, I had to learn this from the ground up, um, you know, the nuts and bolts, uh, making experiments and, you know, failing and learning from mistakes and getting better. So uh, this is something that's near and dear to me. And I've really gotten the the, the depths of it and have uh, kind of mastered the basics of, of the art of it. So, and in that, you know, in that course of time, um, I've raised over 60,000 for the series. So uh, there's definitely been six, some success there. Obviously, I've had a uh, you know, points of failed campaigns, but I've also had for the past uh, going on six years now, a hundred over a hundred percent funded campaigns. So I know what it's like to both struggle and then also to achieve success and to go beyond even a hundred percent of the desired goal. And my uh, holistic experience in this process, um, you know, is, is kind of interesting too. Uh, I am a lawyer, but of course I'm not your lawyer. Uh, I am uh, just uh, talking about my own experiences and the skills and knowledge that I applied. Um, I've also had some background experience in public relations and fundraising and graphic design as well. So I, I do have some areas of professional specialty that I brought to the table in my own work, but that will be used more so to help inform you of what you might need to get if you don't have those skills. And of course, many people who are going to be doing this will not be lawyers or public relations specialists or anything like that. So you're going to need to think about um, those things along the way. And this is your chance actually to learn from my mistakes um, in the past and to not make those mistakes yourself. Because again, if you can avoid some of the mistakes I made early on when I was doing this, you're going to save a ton of money, a ton of time, and you're going to be a lot happier with your outcome um, once you're uh, moving on to the actual production part of everything. So let's talk about the beginning. Uh, what is the big idea, right? Before you can move forward on your project, if you're looking to actually make your own comic book series, um, you need a mission and a vision. So you need to have really 
honed in on uh, that is your skills um, and then honed in on in terms of the specifics uh, what it is that you're looking to do with your comic book series right um, have you written a storyline have you done any character bios or initial sketches have you have you started to flesh this stuff out um, you don't want to just rush into this without having actually developed the background to it and you really also need to ask yourself um, is this going to be an ongoing series are you doing it a single issue short right these kinds of questions you really need to think about at the beginning because there's different types of, of needs and different types of interests some people are looking to make something that's just like a one shot of a you know a funny thing maybe there's a comedy comic some people want to have a, a series that's infinitely expandable some people have a, a narrow arc they want to have a beginning and an end and then that's it kind of thing so you got to think about what your your goal is there and you also need to think about what you're bringing to the table. Um, are you a writer? Are you illustrator, graphic designer? What what skills do you have? And if you have no skills, well, that's going to be a big hurdle to overcome, which it can be. But you know, it's it's something that you really have to take into consideration in terms of time and cost. So, uh, what form are you going to be working under? This is a very important question to uh, ask yourself at the beginning, and this is the, kind of the parts here where we're talking about seeking a professional help, um, especially uh, legal advice. You need to go to an attorney in your respective jurisdiction to get some help with this uh, process. Um, and when you're going to be creating your comic, you could be doing this um, as a doing business as. That is, you know, you could be creating a fictitious name. You could be creating a corporate entity. You actually, you know, create a corporation under which you do your business. Or you could do it under your own name, which is, you know, the simplest way is just do it yourself. But again, you have some risks there that you have to think about. Um, you're going to be individually responsible for anything that goes right or wrong here. And you might want to just be careful about that. Um, so a corporation might give you certain legal privileges and protections, you know, and there is some cost to that. So you just have to say, okay, you know, do I want that? Is that something I, you know, I can afford? That kind of thing, and um, you know, you, you, it's something you're going to have to discuss uh, with an attorney, or at least um, start by looking at what the options are, and maybe an online website like LegalZoom.com. Um, that's a, you know, a place where you can start looking at those things and seeing what opportunities they have and what they can do for you, uh, you know, and just think through those options. But again, um, this is pretty serious stuff. So you have you have to take this part seriously and think about okay, what are your risks? Oh, uh, you know, what are your worst case scenarios? How long are you gonna be doing this for? And uh, making sure that if it makes sense for you, given your total package of everything, that if you're gonna do a corporation, you set that up right and you do everything uh, properly. So. Um, once you have uh, decided on a vision for your outcome, then it, it is time to think toward that goal. So if you got a sense of your story, the basics of you know the characters kind of thing, now you need to kind of take that and put it into fixed form. You want to write down a synops synopsis of the comic series to help you visualize what that end goal is. So would you want to write down what you want to see an outcome for your first crowdsource endeavor here so that way you have a sense of the direction that you're going in when you're going to create um, whatever it is this you know first crowdsource funding campaign for creating your comic so again is that going to be a single comic is it going to be a larger uh, trade paperback ultimate format where you're going to have multiple issues and you want to actually bind them together at the end is it going to be you know an expandable series that kind of thing so you got to think about what it is you're trying to create if you're doing the one-off special, like there's a single issue one shot, of course, there's probably less prep work there. If you're building an entire comic book universe, then you're going to have to be extra, extra careful because you want to make sure everything is done right for continuity. And as you're narrowing down this focus, you definitely need to start generating the ideas of what you have to bring to the table yourself in terms of your skills versus what you're going to hire out for. And just some of the skills that you have to have for a successful outcome here is, of course, comic story writing. You don't have a comic book unless you have the story and the narrative. Um, you're going to need pencils, inks, colors, lettering in some fashion. Uh, it could be physical and digital. It could be purely digital. just depends on who you hire. But those are all a part of making a comic book without um, having the artists to be able to actually take you know what you have and to actually do the the drawings and layouts here and and to color those in right you don't have a comic book so you're going to need those skills whether you bring some or all or none of those skills to the table graphic design is going to be an issue because beyond just the drawings inside you're going to have a character logo potentially or a title logo you'll have layout issues that you have to deal with um if you're running advertisements that might be something to think about too if you're setting up your campaign again graphic design comes in there so you gotta think about that 
Um, you need copywriting skills for the campaign and emails. So if you're doing a crowdsource funding campaign, you're also responsible for building that campaign and building out that information, doing your sales pitch. So can you do that successfully? Do you need to hire out someone to help you do that writing? Again, something to think about. Uh, fundraising outreach is, of course, going to be a big thing because you're going to need to get initial backers. If you're trying to create your comic, and you're trying to raise some funds independently, you're going to need to think about who you're reaching out to for that and what are the best ways to do that. Um, you'll need editing help, whether that's yourself or someone else, just checking for grammar, spelling, you know, just proofreading at a bare minimum, if not, you know, so substantive content, but at a bare minimum, just to make sure that nothing got in there extra that you didn't want there to be, that there's nothing missing when you're writing out those speech bubbles. Uh, website design could also be a thing potentially if you're making a comic book home site or landing page uh, for your series. Um, it's not necessary right off the bat, but a lot of times it, it does help for the long term just to have even a simple WordPress site up. Um, advertising promotion, this could be a thing. Uh, you might be advertising your comic book through uh, ads on Facebook or on Twitter or somewhere else, right? It's possible that you're promoting your campaign uh, digitally or even physically, depending. Um, there's going to be interviewing potentially. Uh, that's something that's going to come up. If you're trying to promote your series, you might get on some podcasts or vlogs, right? There might be some people that have interest in that and they want to interview you. So pre preparing for interviews in the event that you're trying to get the word out there about your campaign. And uh, last, but definitely not least, shipping management, right? Uh, you may successfully create your comic and all the perks and all that good stuff, and then you get in your backers, and now it's like, oh, wait, you also have to ship it. You are responsible for getting your perks to the backers, so now you're responsible for shipping management, and that's its own field of, of specialized knowledge, right? Knowing what's the best way to ship things and, and postage and so forth. So we'll cover a little bit of all these different elements and give you some thoughts about it, but it is something that you have to think about at the onset and think about, okay, what do I bring to the table? What do I have knowledge about, and what do I actually need to get some help for? So the initial legwork for developing your comic, getting off that is on the right foot, uh, requires you're putting together at least a few predicate items, right? So again, just reiterating here, the essentials to the story to move forward are a series synopsis, the story for the first issue, the character descriptions, those will be featured, character to turn designs for the main characters featured. So again, if you want to be successful, you need to have these basic elements down before you move forward, ideally, because otherwise you're going to run to a lot of problems. You really need to know where you're going with the direction. You want to have your story kind of fleshed out, at least in a near final draft before you move forward. You want to have those character descriptions so you know how to communicate them, especially for the artists. And you want to have those turn designs, which is that's going to be a big deal. I'm going to talk about that, that doing your character turns is so essential and sometimes is often Oh, well, I should say sometimes is overlooked and often leads to a uh, failure or critical issues coming up because of lack of continuity. So the series synopsis should be a two to five sentence summary of what the story is about. It should ideally have who the protagonist is or the protagonists are, right? The main characters kind of thing. What the, se the series is about in terms of the conflict slash discourse, right? There's going to be probably some type of interest or intrigue, right? There's some conflict, some issue that has to be figured out or resolved. I mean, there are slice of life comics out there, of course. Um, but even there, there's something that's going to be driving it. So what, what is the kind of the end goal here? And then a hint at where uh, the story is going, right? We want to see, you know, a, a sense of where you're going to be ending up with this for yourself, at least, you know, it doesn't have to be public, but just at least for yourself. Okay, where am I looking to take this next? So I'm going to use a Superman here in a synopsis to help you see what that's like. So Superman is a story of a human-like alien from planet Krypton trying to discover his past and his purpose as he protects those around him. He faces all kinds of enemies and creatures in his quest to preserve truth, justice, and the American way. As the story progresses, he also discovers love and friendship while maintaining a cover identity of Clark Kent as a reporter for the Daily Planet. So as you can see here, right, this Superman synopsis is not comprehensive of all possible details or a hyperbolic description of, you know, making it sound extreme. It's just the core elements of what it is that is going on for the story and kind of this broad overview of what's taking place, right? It's giving you a reminder of the overarching storyline goal here and giving you a sense of, okay, this, you know, this is where I'm heading. This is the overall concept just to keep things focused uh, for what you're doing. Uh, the deepest details for the story are developed in the character bios and the individual issue storylines, right? So you, you would go deeper beyond that as you develop the character uh, bios and as you start to actually write out your single issues. Once you have your uh, synopsis, it's time to think about what characters are going to be appearing in uh, your first issue. So obviously you want to get off on the right foot, so you need to make sure that, okay, if I'm going to have 
certain number of characters that are going to lead the story, you want to have those characters' uh, details fully fleshed out. And you need that for both the artwork element and you need it for how they're going to be participating in the story, right? And to develop that character, you need their bio, describing the qualities of the character and their drive, a character description, how they look for initial concept drawings. Again, you need both the element that lets you write the narrative, the dialogue um, about the character, and you need concepts that you can actually communicate what they look like to the artist so they can draw it properly. Um, so here's an example from my own series, a, a voluntarist here. Um, so Jack Lloyd is the protagonist in this uh, tale. Um, and he's a 23-year-old man who recently graduated college with a mechanical engineering degree. He grew up on his family's farm. He likes to be sarcastic and has an engaging, curious demeanor. His goal is to rescue his parents to the government as he tries to figure out why the government is enslaving humanity. So th it kind of gives you here a little bit of a character description, a little bit of his background, a little bit of his mission. Um, height, 5 foot 10 inches, weight 185 pounds, look white male with tone build, brown hair flipping slightly upward, or sorry, slightly up forward, uh, blue eyes, his super suit has an upside down A symbol with a yellow V chest line, a yellow belt with a V symbol and white stripes going from the inside of his wrist, splitting down his arms and wrapping back around his elbows to his legs, ending in a sharp white stripe point. So again, just describing some of the bare bones basics here about the character, how tall they are, their build, their looks, some um, you know elements of their outfit, and some of their you know personal background and history. Again, you need this kind of stuff so that you can stay focused and have continuity on how they're going to be developed, both visually and in the story. So again, you want to have specific details about this character's history and their aesthetics. Um, you're going to need these, uh, you know things in comparative to, right? So you're going to need to be thinking about how this character looks as compared to others, right? Are they taller or shorter than others? Um, or do they have special unique clothing designs that are essential for the story, right? Do they have special objects that come with them? Again, you need these things fleshed out so that you have these in your turn drawings to make sure that they are drawn correctly and have the, you know, the same continuity going forward. So once you have the idea for your character down and you have this all written out for yourself, then you're able to use that character description for initial mockups. Now, your initial storyline that you write could come in many forms, right? So writing a comic book story doesn't always have to be neat and perfect in comic book form, right? You, you can generate your ideas and kind of get a vision before you get to the final formatting of, okay, you know, let me put this into comic book form. And this is especially helpful if you're not as used to writing comic book form and sometimes just getting that stream of consciousness out, you know, even if it's just messy, it's just great just to get it on paper and just to help you start somewhere, right? You know, getting hung up on the formatting right away might be a, a mental block. So it might just be easier for you to, in the beginning, just to get ideas down. So you could start with the pure narrative, like a traditional fictional novel, right? If you have, um, you know, just kind of that format kind of ready to go in your head, you know, you're writing down things like as if you're writing a, a novel, that's fine. You know what I mean? Again, it, the question is just, are you getting down the storyline and can you then adapt that further? Some um, do work just from speech dialogue, like they envision in their head conversations with characters and they just start with there, right? They imagine this conversation happening, um, you know, between or among multiple characters, right? And that's just a way to get it down there for yourself. So you're starting to envision what it is. Um, and then some, of course, just go straight to working on each sequential page, right? Some people are just comfortable in the comic book format. They already kind of have a sense of it and they're just like, okay, well, I'm just going to start writing in that comic book format and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with starting with a non-comic book format in terms of just getting over that hump and getting your ideas down but of course whatever you do you will have to eventually adapt it to a comic book style so just remember that you know even if you're starting off in that kind of brain spill way you're gonna have to adjust and for myself i did not start with the comic book uh, method i i started with a movie script method and I eventually transitioned to making it more of a comic book style format because I thought at first that I might make this for a movie. And then I was like, mm, you know, a comic book is going to make more sense with what I can reasonably do. A movie doing that right costs a lot more money, right? So the comic book medium seemed like a good uh, format. So again, what works for you is just going to be, you know, dependent on how you get your ideas down readily for yourself. Uh, you know, and and just don't get hung up on that, you know, initially. Get your ideas down, feel comfortable, just whatever it is, just brain spilling, just writing down ideas, you know, putting a notepad, whatever, just get it down so you have something to look at and reflect on and, and then draw from. So once you have something down, you know, you're going to be putting that into that sequential page format. 
and sequential page here means you know the individual comic book pages. Um, and you have to break up those pages in a manner that does not overload each page with speech bubbles. So that is a serious issue, right? You have that you have limitations here. You know, in a in a novel format, you're just writing page after page. Page it doesn't really matter because uh, it just flows from one to the next. Whereas in a comic book, if you put too many words on one page, you're not going to see the art, right? And a comic book is part art part the speech dialogue bubbles so you don't want to cover up beautiful art with too many uh you know dialogue balloons so uh you got to really understand and become comfortable with what that pacing is and uh, that is going to possibly fall to some rules but of course as with anything with art there's rules and then there's rules you know meant to be broken right so my rules for myself is I try to keep it around 100 text words per page, 60 to 80 maybe tops, and that ends up being five or fewer longer sentences or at or under 10 shorter sentences. Um, and again, these rules are not absolute. There's always going to be exceptions somehow, whatever. Maybe there's like one giant balloon for some special page and it's got a lot there or – Maybe, you know, just the way that it's it's written, you just really need that back and forth. And it, it's OK if it's, you know, aesthetically meant to have a lot of words like kind of competing. But by and large, you usually want the artwork visible, uh, you know, mostly. Right. You want at least like 80 percent of that artwork visible typically. Uh, so that way you can actually see it and enjoy it. Um, but again, as, as you go through, you're going to get a sense of it. So if you use my basic rules to start, you can see how that looks. And then you can kind of get a feel for that yourself and you'll play with it and figure it out. Um, here's some examples with uh, the right and the wrong ways to do things, right? So I'm just showing you here uh, the example with too many words, right? So that left side design was an older design with a company that's gone defunct. And while you could potentially make your way through all those words, it is rough. You do not want to have people struggling to figure out who's talking where. And as you can see, there's way too many balloons uh, covering this up. The artwork's covered. It's hard to figure out who's talking when. It is terrible. You know, and that was a learning experience for me. I made those mistakes of, of putting too much into one page. And fortunately, of course, this page has been remastered. And so this is now an old edition on, you know, on the left, but um, it was a learning experience on the right. I, I did the lettering on that page. Um, and that's a part of my remastering. It's not the same page, but it's, you know, different thing. And as you can see there, there's some words, there's quite a few, you know, balloons, but it's not covering up all the artwork, right? It's, it's really leaving most of the artwork open and you are able to follow along readily with who is saying what. There's no overwhelming confusion. So again, be careful uh, and <laughs> make sure that you have your word balance right. Otherwise, you're going to have frustrated readers and they're going to be an annoyed with that outcome. All right. So formatting your storyline for the primary artist depends on what works best for you. So there are many ways to write a comic book script uh, in terms of how you write the words and say what goes where. And it could be less organized to more organized. I created my own format that I would consider semi-organized. I don't really uh, do it where it's like, here's exactly where this box has to go and this has to be this way perfectly. I, I leave it a little bit more open. Um, so you can see here, this, this is just my way of, uh, of writing. So I put this uh, instruction sheet together where I say page is the page number, scene is a description of the scene or scenes, uh, a name with text is the speech bubble words. So in other words, that's a character's uh, talk. A text box is text for a box and a speech bubble. So it's like narration or something descriptive. And then a thought bubble. Um, again, it, you know, there's people who are not speaking, but it's a thought bubble, that kind of thing. So I, I have these different labels to kind of say what's going to be what. And as you can see here, um, there's an example that, that I have below. It says page six, it sets a scene, and then there's a text box, right? So as opposed to me telling the artist, here's where everything's going to go box by box, scene by scene, and being very uh, controlling over it, I'm a little bit more loose because I like to let the artist have some creative freedom there, and that lets them play with it and make it more exciting, possibly beyond what I could have originally imagined. You know, I, it's not like I don't have, you know, bad idea like i have bad ideas or something it's just sometimes when you're working with the artist they can balance things a little bit better than maybe you originally see so 
uh, you know, again, I, uh, I have that generalization of, of the descriptions. Um, you know, the artist gets more freedom so that they can play with a little bit more. Um, but if you do actually want to have more control over what goes where, you definitely can. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, that might be convenient for artists that are not as creative that way. Um, but this is an example of a direct layover version. So this is an example of showing how within this comic book page template that I have up here, you can create boxes and kind of show what it is you want within those directly, right? So if you're using Photoshop or something like that, you can you know put in your template, here's what I want in this square or in this zone, and you can break it apart piece by piece. Again, it's, it's another way to get it more specifically what you want by like saying, I want this to be this size, like the specific cell, and you can, you know, arrange it how you want. But again, um, it's it's up to you and the artist and what they need or what um, is uh, necessary to get the outcome that you want right. So some will go as far as to make every single page written out in a Word document and place reference panels like you just saw. So some of you will actually have a very detailed Word document that's like, this is what goes where, and they'll have a reference thing. It's like, this is super specific, super detailed, super like, you know, controlling of what goes where. Again, it's up to you if you want to do that. If you're like, I must have it this certain way, understandable, it's it's your project. Um, but that will take more work at the onset, right? Because then if you're actually saying every, you know, where every single element must go and you have to lay all that out, it's going to be a lot. So, Here's an example of, of doing that. I'm just you know quickly showing here that you could have a panel up top and you say, Jack Lloyd is standing, look over the city from a skyscraper in New York City. It's a sunny day. The streets are bustling with movement, right? So you could have written down what it is and then you just lay out the panels, that kind of thing. And you could go even more detailed than this. Um, just depends on what you want to do. Uh, but again, it's up to you whether you want to be more controlling of the outcome or you want to give the artist a little bit more freedom to potentially make things interesting in a way that maybe you didn't initially envision or, or see. Just depends on um, quality of the artist you're working with, their creativity, and your comfortability. So again, keep these uh, ideas in mind um, and uh, you know, you'll you'll figure it out, right? You know, you're going to you're going to see it no matter what and especially when you're first starting out, you're going to get a sense of what works, what doesn't, you know, maybe you'll be more loose at the beginning. You're like, oh, okay, I'm too loose. They're not getting me what I want. And you move stricter. You might be really strict in the beginning. And then you'd be like, ah, actually that didn't come out the way I was thinking. What do you think? Could you, know, could you ask the artist, could you come up with something different? You'll play with it. You'll get a sense of um, your primary artist's design and aesthetic skills, and you'll figure it out. It just, it comes with the territory of figuring out how you're going to lay out your comic book. So, now that you have a sense of how you can uh, you know, write out what, what it is you're going to be laying out in your comic book, you need to think about how many pages you're going to be making in total too. Um, typical industry standard comic books, they're going to have 20, 24 sequential art pages pretty typically. Um, I like using 24 personally. Um, how you do is up to you. Just note that if you do have fewer than 20 pages, you're not likely going to satisfy a typical comic book reader as they're acclimated to single issues being 20 or more. Right. So you need 20 or more pages typically um, to really make someone feel like they have a full comic book. And that's 20 or more sequentials, not just advertisements or an interior, um, you know, uh, opening page, like a dedication page. That's that's the actual art. Uh, Kablam, uh, which is a service we'll be talking about later, their minimum page count is four pages plus the interior covers. So that's six total interior pages. We'll discuss that more later. And if you're intentionally going to be making a short or a teaser, which is fine, there's some people out there who make like a little teaser comic and it's like 10 or 12 pages and it's just meant to be like a little uh, test in the waters thing or something that's a little short, funny thing, you know, that's fine. Just make sure that you're letting the backers know that this is a short teaser or a pitch comic. So that way they're not shocked when they open up and it's like, why is this 10 pages or 12 pages, you know, as opposed to 20, 24, 30, whatever. Um, so again, it's, it's okay to do. You just got to let people know that this is intentionally short as a, as a teaser or a, a kind of like a promotional comic thing. So if you're not a writer, this will be tough <laughs> for you, but um, it is not impossible, right? So if you're not a comic writer and you do not plan to become one, then you're going to have to be careful moving forward because you're going to need a writer, obviously, 
to bring this story to life. And you're going to have to hope that they stick with you to keep things consistent as best as possible. Um, and really after you, you know, you've put down your story synopsis and care descriptions, that's, you know, when you're going to be able to look for a writer, right? You, if you don't even have like some basic concepts and ideas to get to a writer, then how do you even have a story, right? So you, you, you will have to write something. It just might not be the whole story. You know, it might just be, here's my vision of where I want this comic to go. Here's the characters kind of basic descriptions. And now I can find a writer who will bring it to life in comic book form. Um, again, it's, it's not something that I really suggest, but we'll save that discussion more for later because there's some other considerations that come with it with contracts and pre-production things. But, you know, again, just keep that in the back of your mind. Let's reflect more on your skills now, right? So we've gotten down the basics to your story's premise, like the ideas of like, okay, generating what it is that you want to write about, some character descriptions, thinking about how you're going to format what you're writing as you're moving forward. Um, it's your time to reflect on what you're going to bring to the table and what you'll need help on, right? Because you got to know what it is you need to bring to the table from outside so that you can actually get this stuff done. Um, this is an example down below from my own work. Uh, when I started this in 2012, um, that is the actual comic book stuff. I brought to the table a legal background, public relations background, story writing, graphic design, fundraising, copywriting, and basic web design, which is pretty substantial. I will admit that is that is uh, pretty unique. Not as many people are going to have that many skills to bring to the table, especially in those zones. What I still needed, though, was editing and quality control. I needed uh, extra eyes, and my lack of getting extra eyes early on was was a big hindrance to my success and that's that's really something i'm going to harp on throughout this is that you want to have extra eyes and editing to make sure that you know everything is in continuity and that your whatever is written is is written not just well but there's no mistakes you know by the letter i needed a primary penciler so obviously i needed a primary artist the person who's drawing out the comic i need an anchor so anchor is the person who adds the digital inks over the pencils uh, making the black lines as opposed to just the lighter gray pencil lines. I need a colorist. I needed a letterer, and that was early on. Um, eventually, I did pick up lettering as a skill myself, and I'm not like the best letter in the world, but I'm definitely better than average. And uh, you know, I just was like, oh, you know, I, I could pick up that too. So again, you, you never know down the road what you might be able to pick up if you have you know a, a certain skill, or if you're a little artistically inclined, you might you know pick something up. Um, I needed advertisement, um, so I needed means and ways to do advertising, um, and I needed a printer. Uh, I can't print my own comic books, obviously. I don't have my own production uh, house with uh, a place to to print out these books, so kind of need uh, a place where they can actually get my digital comic pages into a print comic. So whatever skills you don't have you're going to have to either pick up yourself or hire up for. That's just the brass tacks. There's no way around that, right? To get to the finish line, either you're doing it or somebody else is. So most people can readily learn some of the basic skills, though, uh, that you know you might need to move forward, right? Basic comic book writing. That's not hard to pick up. You know, If you're already inclined creatively, you probably already have some skills here in, in being you know a writer right that's the whole reason you're doing a comic book is you, you kind of have some creative vision with a story so it's just learning a little bit about how to make that you know pop out in comics and how to do the the dialogue and stuff like that and just describing the pages now basic web design these days websites are pretty easy to make they weren't you know as much back in the day but now you can go on like wordpress.com and create a basic website in a matter of like an hour with very you know, minimal skills needed because everything is just WYSIWYG. Like what you see is what you get. You just play with it directly. It's it's nowhere near as complicated um, as it was in the past to to make a, a halfway decent and responsive website. So again, even if it's just a single landing page, it's letting people know about the campaign and where to pick up the comic. could be easy to do. Um, basic graphic design for layouts. This is probably one of the most important skills you can pick up. And the reason why is because if you are able to do um, edits or modifications or notes on the digital files, you're going to be in great shape. If you're able to, you know, do your own formatting really quick so you can submit, you're going to save a lot of time. And it's not too hard to big up, pick up the Photoshop basics. Uh, you can go on YouTube and readily watch just a few videos about Photoshop basic tools and basic saving things and be able to just you know, work, work, not like as an artist, like I'm going to draw things from scratch, but just work with a file and note 
make notations on a file and save it and give it to uh, whoever is doing your primary art colors to make notes. So again, basic graphic design, very basic, I'm saying just for formatting is, is very helpful. Uh, email campaigns, pretty straightforward to, to pick up these days, you know, things like constant contact or MailChimp, just thinking about how you can send out um, emails to people or emails to backers or potential backers, that kind of thing could be useful. Um, Indiegogo and Kablam tools and formatting, of course, uh, that's kind of something that you might need to have no matter what, because it you know, you need to be in control of your crowdsource fundraising. You need to be in control of the Kablam website, like for actually publishing your comics. So you really kind of just want to pick those up, you know, just how those work at a basic level. Even if somehow you manage to find someone that was doing it for you, I guess you have the resources to have an assistant. You should know how to uh, use the basics of Indiegogo or whatever other site you use um, and Kablam, you know, how that site works. Most people cannot readily pick up though, uh, the legal analysis and specialized art skills. So those are kind of the areas where not you're not as likely going to be able to just be like, yeah, I'll, I'll pick that up right away, right? You're not going to have a law degree and be able to write all the contracts and think of the legal issues the way you want readily. Um, you're not going to, you know, day one have no primary art skills, like in terms of, you know, drawing characters from scratch. And the next day, you're a super talented, you know, primary artists who can draw characters super well, you know, unless you already had those skills, you're not going to be picking that up overnight anytime soon. So that's usually where you're definitely going to hire out, right? You're going to most likely for most people, you're going to have to get some help on the legal side of things. Um, especially if you're just, you decide to do a corporation, you're going to need that for contracts and you're going to need um, that for the people who are doing the, the primary art. If you yourself are not one of those primary artists right off the bat. So once you've thought about what you can do and willing to pick up, list out what you can do and that which you need help to do. So again, listing this out for yourself is important because you need to see what it is that you bring to the table. You need to see, oh, okay, what do I need to get and have I accomplished that, right? You need to make sure that you have that down. So in this case, you know, what I said for myself, what I can do, I can define the characters. I could write the initial comic story. I could set up a basic website of WordPress, accept the Indiegogo, accept the campaign messages to draw interest. What I need to hire out for was the initial character designs, artists for creating the comic pages, an editor to go for what I write, and a lawyer for contracts with artists. Oh, well, actually, I didn't need that in this case, but for myself, but it is an example of, of what it is that you might you know, need in the, in the event that those are not your skills that you have. So hiring artists is the trickiest part. It's very tricky. The reason why it's so tricky is because it involves working with other people who have their own schedules and their own interests. Uh, you know, when you're working in the freelance world, um, that person is not fully dedicated to you, right? They're not being hired as an employee unless you have a lot of money to throw, right? It's, it's, it's just not the case. You're, you're typically working with them as a freelancer because they're working with many different clients, right? And maybe they like their autonomy for whatever reason, or, or they're just, you know, maybe trying to build their own series, that kind of thing. But there's time conflicts and scheduling conflicts and things like that. So some of the issues that can arise with hiring artists, of course, is the location of the artist, right? Um, not all artists are going to be where you live. You're, you know, you might work with artists in another country. In fact, most of the artists I work with are in other countries and they have different time zones where they're working. So that's something interesting to think about. The fit of the style of artwork, right? When you're looking for an artist, there could be a talented artist, but they don't have the style that you're looking for, right? So just because someone's good in their zone doesn't mean that they're good for the zone that you want to produce. Um, their ability to work uh, on an entire issue, right? You need to be able to lock someone down for an entire issue. The last thing you want is you hire an artist, right? You're halfway through your comic, and all of a sudden like, hey, um, something came up, I can't finish your comic, and you're halfway through. That's horrific. That would be scary. And I've fortunately never had that happen to me, but I've no, I've known it to happen to other people. So that's something you got to be careful about and you got to make sure you have your contracts, right? So that they're committed for the entire project. Uh, turnaround time, right? You got to make sure that they're someone who's going to turn around within the time that you need, especially if you have a delivery date for backers that you need to meet. Um, the willingness to sign a work for hire contract, right? So, when it comes to hiring an artist, they, they got to sign an agreement with you to make sure that you have the right to use the artwork um, in the legal world. Because if you don't have that, you can get in some deep trouble and you could put yourself in some real legal hot waters if you don't have a good work for hire contract. So you got to be careful. And there's crediting issues, right? So uh, if you don't have that contract solid, 
you could be stuck having to credit this artist for every single place that you post the, the work and that could be really annoying and that's something you may not want where you don't want that to be in the way of something else so again there's a lot to think about when it comes to hiring an artist it's very tricky so when you're beginning your search for hiring artists one of the first things you're looking for is the style of artwork right um you know there's different genres that artists could do within the comic book world. There's traditional American comic book style, there's anime style, there's simple comic book style like web comics, there's some special artistic zones like a steampunk feel, 80s style or cyberpunk, something like that. You know, there, there's different zones of art. So you need to figure out what kind of artwork you want, the style for the outcome. And that will determine which type of artist you're going to end up working with. And for me, I'm in the traditional American style. Right. So um, not the oversized anime or manga style eyes, uh, you know, not cyberpunk or anything like that. It's just traditional American style of, of comics. More, in other words, a little bit more realistic human proportions kind of thing. And before you look, though, but before you actually get into the thicket, um, again, this is not legal advice. This is just informational purposes that you could definitely kind of speak with a lawyer in your jurisdiction or use a you know, legal service online like LegalZoom where they connect you with a lawyer to get this stuff set up. Um, you need to get a solid contract template down so that you're able to use the artwork as you please. Um, and this zone is entertainment slash you know, contract law. So you're looking for a contract slash entertainment lawyer those are the types of lawyers that typically handle these types of issues uh because you're dealing of course with art and contracting and when you are getting this uh, template to work with um you want to make sure that you get all the rights to the artwork including the crediting which is called droid moral rights if you want to maximize your ability to use this this artwork right so if you don't have that then you could find yourself owing the artist extra money uh, and royalties. You could find uh, yourself being sued for not crediting, all kinds of stuff. You don't want that. So you want to make sure you talk to whoever is the lawyer that you're speaking to and just say, hey, I need a contract where I get all the rights, including crediting. I, I, I need everything transferred, right? And that's the only way you're going to make sure that you know when they sign that, that that is uh, going to take care of you and that they won't be able to successfully come after you uh, for royalties or anything you know, else like that, especially as you're the one who's taking the risk, right? You know, you're you're the person who is um, foregoing uh, the potential uh, benefits of the money at, at first. You're trying to, you know, make this investment in yourself and to create this series. The artist is getting money up front. It might not be successful at all. You're taking the risk. Um, so you, uh, you know, want to make sure that you're in good straits at the end of the day, no matter what. Um so don't hire anyone you know that's a short answer that don't hire anybody uh, unless you have that signed agreement done properly according to you know what your lawyer tells you uh and you know make sure you have your rights and turnaround time secured within there so everything is clear so again speak with the entertainment contracts lawyer or get with the you know the legal online service where they connect with the lawyer kind of thing get that contract set up for yourself shouldn't be too crazy expensive but it's you, you can't do this without it. You will be in, in deep doo doo if you don't have a good agreement to work with when you're hired. So, once you have your contract template complete, then you're able to move on to looking for artists now, like you know, for real. So, typically, what we'll find talent is some kind of comic artist sub, such as on deviantart.com, Fiverr, Facebook group comic artists. Um, could be also something that you find uh, in, a, in a different uh, venue, like you Google up, you know, talent in your area, maybe you look for comic book artists in your state, whatever. There's, there's lots of ways that you can um, look up different artists in different areas. Um, so, but, but before you're able to select an artist here, you need to have some, some ideas grounded about what it is that uh, you're able to afford and to do. So what kind of budget, right? You got to start there. You can't just pick out any old artists you'd be like oh okay i want this artist and they cost three four times than what you got the budget for that's not going to work so if you have a lower budget you might need to focus your efforts on foreign artists who can charge a lower rate because the cost of living is cheaper so it's common to hire artists from indonesia philippines argentina brazil pakistan they charge half to third the rates of many american artists again it's a great way to leverage the uh, economic uh differences among countries where cost of living is much cheaper you can get some great talent 
um, overseas and save a bit of money that way. Again, you might have to deal with some language barrier issues, but it's pretty common to find artists who are at least basic English proficient um, overseas because it's just such a common way for those artists to make a lot of money, right? They make more money by being, you know, being a freelancer over in Asia or wherever, and they learn, you know, enough English that they can get by so that they can, you know, keep making comparatively to, you know, to the, to other people, there more money. And then you have to ask yourself what quality level you look for, right? The typical high detail mainstream page can cost, um, can run four to $600 per page. Right. And that's, in, you know, in American artist terms, it can be very expensive if you're hiring American side and you, you want a higher quality page. Um, that same page may only cost two or 300 if hiring foreign. So again, you could be cutting your costs in half if you're able to secure uh, a foreign artist. So let's take a look at some figure ranges here, just food for thought. And uh, these artists rate uh, ranges are just based on my own knowledge and experience. I've worked with over 50 different artists and various things from around the world, many different countries. These are 2022 rates. And I've also estimated these looking at some other figures too online from uh, different companies. So as you can see, um, you know, low quality to high quality, there's there's different quality levels and what you're going to pay for that. And when we're talking low quality to high quality, we're talking about how much detail there is in each page and how good the proportions are, right? So high quality, high detail, great proportions. Low quality, <laughs> low detail, not great proportions. Medium quality, you know, pretty good detail and pretty good proportions, you know, not the highest. So that's that's what we're looking at, right? And as you can see here, there's different ranges, you know, uh, in, in American terms, they, they can be 50 to to $100 a page for low quality, up to 200 to 400 per page for pencils, high quality. Whereas foreign, low quality, 10 to $50 a page, up to 100 to 200 page, high quality. So, you know, it, you really just kind of use this as a heuristic um, and a range. You, it's not going to particularly tell you what any given artist is going to charge, but it might give you a sense of what you can reasonably look for again this is 22 2022 rates and with inflation those rates are are ratcheting up so you know unfortunately how static these numbers will be you know we'll, we'll see uh but this should give you a good starting point to think about and also when you make your requests you'll, you'll quickly find out in the responses what turns up so so you know you can also choose among these artists uh, to do foreign and American, right? Because you could have multiple artists uh, for different parts. So you could maybe say, okay, I want a really good American artist for the primary pencils, right? You're like, that's the most important part. And then the inks, colors, letters, you can offshore that, right? That's that's a possibility. You, you can form fit what you think, you know, is best to have in terms of, okay, this needs to be the highest quality and this, you know, does it is doesn't need to be as absolutely the best or stellar, right? You you can fit the artist to your budget, no problem. And that number one place to spend, of course, is on the primary art. Um, you know, inks and color perfections can be looked overlooked a little bit more readily, um, but bad primary art, you know, it, it's just, the figures are just drawn really poorly and not proportional and, and, and just wonky. It's just it's not going to look good, right? You know, so you really want to make sure that that base element is good. And even if the colors are like not as rich or have as much depth, if the figures are otherwise drawn well and right, it's like, okay, whatever, you know, it's a little bit more forgivable, but it's very, it's a lot harder to forgive bad primary art. So um, lettering is of course important to have done right as well, but letters don't usually cost that much even to just do basic um, but effective designs, right? You don't need like the world's best letterer in order to have competent, just well-balanced lettering. Um, it, you know, it's it's up to you, of course, as always, but it's 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 less difficult to get done right, and it's not as expensive. So, um, a request for proposal is a way that you can get uh, people to come to you. Um, you know, as opposed to just going out and looking through a bunch of profiles or just trying to search online, you can uh, readily make a request for a proposal and see who comes your way. Um, there is an RFP uh, on the DeviantArt's jobs board uh, there. They have a, a job offers board. You can actually put your request there. Um, you can also do an RFP on Fiverr. Uh, so fiverr.com um, has you know, a place where you can post 
jobs. Uh, the issue there is Fiverr has its own legal agreement issues that you have to look at with a lawyer. You can also get someone to sign a contract independently, but I've, I've used Fiverr for different things. So definitely two places that you can seek out artists on and have them even submit to you. So the RFPs allow you to set the standards of what you want and have artists submit their portfolios to you, right? So you can actually get the artists um, to, to reach you and, and self-select for what they think, you know, they want or what they think, you know, would make sense for them. Um, this could be a great way to start, especially if you've never done this kind of thing before. It might be easier to have the artists come to you and you just, you know, select that of who submitted. Um, the RFP is also actively engage those who are looking for work, right? So the fact that someone's seeking you out after you post that means, oh, hey, they're actually open for work, right? So that's kind of a, an important predicate, right? Because you could reach out to someone, but they're too busy or the, the product's too big for what they have going on otherwise. But if you have an RFP, well, then clearly they're reaching out because uh, they think they have the time for your project. So, um, you know, the writer hiring note, just bring this back up as we're talking about RFPs. If you're not ready for the series, you're going to have to find a writer. Again, I warn against doing this because getting other writers can create conflict over direction, right? You you really want to have your ultimate creative control if you're the one designing the series. And so, you know, that, that's an area where it's a little bit easier to get into conflict over how things go. So, follow, you know, finding the writer will follow the same principles as hiring artists, just that you're going to get writing samples instead of art samples um, from those artists. But... Yeah, you really sh should probably not do that, you know, unless, you know, there's there's two times that I can think of where it's useful. One is when you're actually already really big and you, you need more writers for different issues, right? And that makes sense. Of course, you have a bigger company. Or, you know, if you genuinely have the money to throw at a comic already, you don't need as much of the crowdsource funding thing, and you, but you just don't have the time and it really is tough. Okay, fine, right? But by and large, this, does, this just doesn't describe most people. Most people, if you're in this zone, you're there because you want to have the creative control and direction. So it's worth it just to, you know, write for yourself. And then if, if necessary, hire an editor later, someone who could help refine what you do. All right, so the first pitch. Let's talk about this first pitch here and, uh, you know, you kicking off your beginning stage of this comic creation. So your first request that you're going to need typically is the character turn, right? So you're not diving right in right away to getting a, a comic book done. You need your character design so you have them for continuity and reference, right? Character turns are displays of your character at different angles so that the character can be consistently drawn later on. And they're essential. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, do not skip your character turn stage. Learn from me. I skipped it. It was a bad idea. Right, I went straight into like one character mock and let's start writing. You will have so many struggles just trying to keep the continuity because you don't have that reference. You don't have that visual cue for yourself to double check. Don't skip it. Don't put it off. You will suffer. Just get those character turns done so that way you have that reference for yourself and for the artist to make sure that everything stays the same and stays exactly how you envisioned it from the beginning. So this is a character turn demo. This is a voluntarist. This is a, as simple as it gets, right? So in this character turn demo, we have a frontal shot, side shot, back shot, angled shot, just to give a sense of that suit design and, and facial structure. Some people also have props drawn in. Some people also do close-ups with the bust as well. So you can do a, a close-up on the face. Um, I already had a bunch of other stuff. I didn't need it in this case. This is kind of the bare minimum character turn demo, right? So again, if budget's constraints don't allow for more details or more outfits, whatever, get that one base character turn done at least of the character and their primary outfit with the right angles. Cause then at least you have that to work with. And then maybe as budget allows, you can get props drawn or other outfits drawn, but you need that base or you will have a bad time. So again, that character sheet needs to have those those body proportions set for reference. They need to have the, the full wrap around of them so you can actually see, okay, what does their back look like? What does their side look like? And so on and so forth. Again, you will most likely have an incorrect representation slip through if because you don't catch the small changes, especially in the beginning where an artist could accidentally misalign something or miscolor something, you know, and you don't even catch it because it's just at the edge, you know, of, of their suit or, at, you know, at a weird place, you know, 
just get those character drawings done and down, you will thank yourself and me later. All right, so now that we see where we're going with this character turn for request for proposal, let's get you set up for success and write your proposal, right? You need in your RFP the style of art desired, right? So you need to say what kind of genre you're working in. Um, if you're doing the anime, you know, slash manga style, that will need to be noted. If it's American style, that'll be need to be noted. Um, the format of the outcome. So what you're looking for in delivery might be, um, you know, a, a size, uh, you know, sheet, you know, a certain uh, Photoshop format or Illustrator just depends on what you're working in there. Um, the amount being offered for the completed commission. So you need to talk numbers. Do not hide numbers. It, it's terrible. Artists need to know they're getting paid and how much it is. And if you don't put that clear and upfront, you're going to waste your time with so many people who are, you know, not there for the right uh, budget. So again, you want your RFP to be very specific and discerning so you don't waste your time with people who are not the right fit. Uh, the turnaround time, right? You need to have one you want it done by. Otherwise, you know, you, you could be dilly dallying forever. It's 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 not a good thing to not have a, you know a, a specific turnaround time. Um, the description of what's wanted, right? In this case, we're talking about a character turn, so you might be saying you know four uh, positions and a bust or something like that. Um, limitations for the application: uh, definitely want an adult aged artist. Why? Because. You need an adult to be able to sign contracts, right? You need someone who can actually authorize for themselves. Hey, I'm transferring rights. So it's very nice that there's some young people out there who are burgeoning artists. They want to do things. I, you know, I appreciate you people, young people who are who are trying to do that. But in legal norms, you need someone who can actually give up or a, a consent to the rights transfer. So unfortunately, for many places, that's 18 plus. Um, it's just the nature of the legal system. So yeah, sorry, you know, 17 year old artists who really have great talents. You know, I, I personally couldn't hire you until you turn of legal age, you can actually sign a contract. And of course, a country is another uh, issue there as well. Some uh, times you might want to limit where the artist is from. You might say US only, for example. You're like, okay, I, I just want to work with US artists for whatever reason, maybe a legal reason. Um, sometimes you don't want to work with a certain artist because the country has weird laws that you, that you don't want applying to you. Like, I won't work with. Um, French artists, for example, not because, you know, I have anything against artists who are French, but those who are in France, France has a, a legal structure issue that I don't uh, want to deal with, um, you know, in terms of crediting. So I, I, I would not work with a, a, an artist based in France who's, you know, French citizen kind of thing. Um, payment method, uh, you know, you need to know how you're doing your payments. Uh, for a lot of people, that is most commonly PayPal. And the reason why is PayPal has the greatest international presence. So PayPal lets you be able to convert currencies, you know, in a way that many others don't. Um, it's possible to do other things like Square, um, Stripe, uh, Venmo even. Of course, if you do Venmo, you know, that you have no way to get your money back. But again, there, there's, there's lots of ways that it could be done. Uh, but it's just most common is usually PayPal, even though PayPal has... Uh, had quite a few bad things about them happen with like them not, um, you know, paying out on time with certain people. Um, it still tends to be the default for, especially for international. But again, there's there's probably more. You just got to look into it. And then a little bit about your project and your goals, right? So you need to at least describe what it is you're what you're looking for with your project and your goals. You don't have to give away everything from your comic here, and you shouldn't. You should keep private what is sensitive. But you need to talk a little bit about what the the outcome is. So let's take a look at one such example. So this right here is a, a posting title. So this would be as if I posted this on DeviantArt on their jobs form. So it's the title says comic book original character turn commission artist wanted 150, right? So it's for comic book. We're understanding the, the context. Character turn commission. Okay, you want a character turn. And you have the price right there and then. So again, that money right there up in front, you want that in the title because you, you don't even want someone clicking who thinks that's too low, right? You don't want you don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste their, their, time, their time. Put it in the title so people know. And again, that might even attract some, the right people, right? It might be like if you, have a, if you have a good budget, the right kind of people might be like, oh, okay, finally, uh, someone posting something decent in price and they, they come to you. So let your figures help you discriminate in a good way. So hello, deviant art artists. My name is Jim. So I'm just making this up, but and I'm in the process of creating my own comic book series. I'm looking for an artist to take my character concept and turn it 
into a digitally drawn piece on a 17 by 11 inch canvas at 300 dpi showcasing the full body front sides and back of my character standing if you meet the following criteria please post a link to your portfolio below and send me an email of your portfolio to jim's new comic at gmail.com so notice there there's criteria of action right post your deviant art email me as well why because you're testing someone's ability to follow directions one right if already off the bat they can't follow directions they only post below but they don't send you an email you already know whether or not this artist is detail oriented because if they were serious about this they'd be like okay it says post below and email me okay well if they don't email you as well well now you know they're not as serious and or at least they can't understand english enough to know okay i also should email right? Again, little things like that will help you delineate between who is serious and who's not. The serious ones will email you too. And I've used that many times where, you know, I, the, the serious artist, and this did happen, like they, they showed themselves up in my email box and I got quality artists because they actually could read, they actually could follow up, they're professional. So what's the criteria for hire? Must be 18 years of age or older. Obviously, you got to be legal adult to transfer the rights. Must be able to sign and return to work for hire contract. Must be able to complete the artwork within 30 days. Okay, so there you go. You got to turn around, right? Must be able to pencil, ink, and color the finished piece in digital format on a 17-inch by 11-inch canvas at 300 DPI. So again, this is something that's unique here because you're asking someone to do everything, and that is more rare per se. Like It's not always that you have someone who's doing all of those elements, but concept artists typically do. So just keep in mind that concept artists uh, will do all elements, pencil and color when when you're doing concept art. So that that's why it's a little bit different here. You know, normally you might want to split up the artists based on each part, but in this case, again, a concept artist usually does all those things. You must be able to email me the initial concepts for review and feedback. Must be able to take PayPal for payment. Must have an American comic book style, not looking for anime slash manga. Must be able to deliver the final digital master file dot PSD, and then it says see <clears throat> reference of Reference art of similar styles I'm going for over at, and then there's two links to different art styles, like mock-ups that you know, look like this. So again, you're giving them a visual cue of what you're looking for an outcome. That's, of course, very helpful. You want to show them references of other things so that they have a sense of what you're going for. Thank you so much for your generous time and consideration, Jim, jimsnewcomic.com. So as you can see here, this is very thorough. It's, given, uh, it's giving the potential artists a very clear direction of what you want very clear criteria of, of what you need to qualify and very clear direction of, of how to apply. And that is going to make your life much easier because it will help whittle down the artists who are actually able going to, who are actually able to comply with this and who are actually going to be able to successfully complete what you want. So, um, as I said before, again, this is just reiterating again, the requirements here are to help weed out those who do not fall through on directions the very nature of being specific and having the specific instructions is going to just make your life that much easier. And there are no specifics of the character description there. Um, you don't need the specifics of the character description uh, in RFP uh, because you don't need to give away your comic secrets before release. So again, a good artist doesn't need to see all the details about it right off the bat. They'll follow up. And then if there is an issue, like let's just say they say, oh, well, this character is far more detailed than I was imagining. Well, then you can work it out and just say, okay, well, what's your price? Um, but typically to do a basic, you know, request for proposal, character turn thing, they should, you know, most artists should be able to figure out what makes sense for them. So once you made the strong proposal, you are going to find artists coming through your inbox for review. Um, you should take note of their portfolios and investigate their backgrounds to make sure they're a good fit and that it's not a scam. You know, you don't want to be scammed either. So, you know, make sure that this person is who they say they are, follow their links, take a look at their work portfolio, make sure they're not pretending to be somebody else. Serious artists maintain an active deviant art profile and or they will have a website showcasing their work in history. Be wary of anyone who has not posted deviant art or any other art display page for a while, right? If someone hasn't posted anything in a long while, be careful. Um, you know, whether it's on the personal website, Behance or Instagram, because again, someone who's an active freelance artist, especially when you're first starting, you want you want to make sure you're working with someone who's consistent and is and is keeping up with things. They should be posting every so often to whatever it is their deviant art, their website, whatever, right? So look for those things, right? They should be somewhat active. And then again, look to see if the artist has any reviews from past clients. 
especially if the proposal is on Fiverr or DeviantArt, right? If you're doing this on Fiverr, Fiverr should have a work history and they have a star system so you can see if past people are happy. DeviantArt, sometimes you'll see that someone posts their commission work on there and you might see comments of thanks and gratitude for doing a good job. So there are ways to check and see if this artist has, has a work history that seems to be good. One of the biggest artists, uh, mistakes people make in choosing an artist, um, this is a serious issue. You really want to be careful of this. If the artist you're looking at does not have enough pieces in your style, you should beware, right? If they only have one to five pieces showcasing the style you want, uh-uh, especially as a first run thing. Because there's a good chance that this is the artist's best attempt that is not representative of their typical work product. Now, again, it's possible that it is, but you're fresh to this whole thing. You're a first-time comic producer. The last thing you need is to have an artist give you something that is not what you're expecting. Someone who has consistent work product will showcase that style with template-specific drawings great over a period of years. You know, it's possible that someone is new and talented and doesn't have that up yet. But again, is it really worth the risk? Do you have the money to risk that this artist does not actually produce what you're looking for. You know, unless you have the money to burn an experiment, mm, you really want to make sure that whoever you're hiring has a long-standing work product in the genre of what you want. And, and again, if you only see one to five representative pieces, probably better to move on. You want to see someone that has 10, 20, 30 uh, pieces, sequential art pieces that are in your style, or, or, or if it's character design, like showing off different characters they've drawn, you know, it, it should really be something that's consistent and not just like, oh, you know, I here's my best piece and you got one thing or two things. You're like, eh, I don't know if that, you know, you can replicate that. It's not safe. So what happens if you don't find an artist that you want, right? What happens? You get all, the, you post all the stuff, you get some artists, but again, none of them are up to par. Well, you got to go back to the drawing board and figure out if there's something you need to change for your proposal, right? Is your offer too low? Did you underestimate what it would cost? Be realistic. That sometimes hap you know, happens. Someone's like, oh, I want to get a good deal. But yeah, you know, you undershot it by 30, 50 bucks. And that 30 or 50 bucks makes artists go, nah, it's not worth my time, right? Especially if they're foreign, 30, 50 bucks is, is a big amount of money. So you got to be careful. Don't, don't be too much of a cheapskate, especially at the onset where you want to make sure you get quality artists coming through. Did you also post in multiple places? You know, if you only made one proposal on one site, okay, well, you got to expand your reach then, right? You know, you can't just go to one thing and think that that's the end all, right? Take a look at different sites. It could be Behance, could be DeviantArt 5 or whatever. Take a look around. So you can take an active approach too by scrolling through artists on Fiverr uh, or DeviantArt. You can, you know, instead of just doing the RFP, you could also do your own search looking for who's open for commissions. It's up to you, but again, you got you to gotta figure out what makes the most sense for you and, and your time frame and what you need to get done by. So, All right. Once you've found an artist, though, it's time to get them on contract. And with contracts, typically, they're going to be paid half up front. That's the most usual. Uh, half up front, half in completion. Some will require full payment up front, especially those who are extremely high talent. Like, you know, someone who has a serious portfolio, they're very quality talent and you know they're, they're just that high level you know and you have that budget they might ask for it up front um some don't some don't at all uh, especially newer artists who are just trying to get work they, they may not ask for it until the end but you know it's it's something that you just have to be aware of and and be careful of you know you don't want to get scammed out of your money and obviously the artist doesn't want to get scammed out of their money either which is an issue for artists right so both artists and producers don't want to end up having their uh, their money not delivered properly or their product not delivered properly. Properly. So artists often do face this, and this is very unfortunate. It makes me mad as you know a producer because it hurts my relationships with others because people get more scared and skittish about whether something is someone's going to be paid. So this unfortunately does happen where. Uh, Sometimes they'll pay an artist half up front, the artist delivers, and then they run off with it, right? Or uh, they say, oh, well, I didn't like it or whatever. And they, they'll they do this to a bunch of artists to like test out whether or not um, they like their style. And then these a bunch of artists then waste their time. And then whoever is paying or going to pay them only ends up paying one person 
and the rest of the artists only get their half and the, the, the person rejects it. Right. And that's, that's, that's scummy and that's unfortunate. Um, you know, it's, it, it'd be much better if everybody just really tried hard to find the right artist instead of trying to, you know, throw their money to a bunch of different people and then run away with, with only one and not pay the rest of the artists their other half after they deliver. So, uh, but again, if you want to avoid these problems, you got to use good judgment, in hiring artists, the strong work product history, use a good contract that has the terms clearly spelled out. Again, make sure that's solid with, uh, whatever lawyer you're working with. Use the hint method with strong dispute resolution management, pay, uh, PayPal or Fiverr, you know, for whatever pitfalls they may have, they do have great dispute resolution management uh, systems. So you're less likely to get scammed through PayPal or Fiverr because you actually have the ability through the company to dispute things, right? It's not like Venmo where it's going to be like, oh, okay, well, you sent the money and, and uh, good luck with that. You're not going to get back, right? PayPal and Fiverr have some dispute resolution services that could make it more secure, especially as a new person. So moving forward. When you're ready to move forward with the artist, you send over your work for hire agreement, spelling the terms of the design. The artist should sign and send it to you and you back to them. You'll typically then pay half up front to be in the work. At that point, you can send the carrier description. If they want the carrier description first before signing work for hire, you may need a non-disclosure agreement first. So again, if, if the artist needs more detail before they sign, then that's fine. You're going to need to have a non-disclosure, which, you know, again, the, the attorney that you work with, you can get that from them as well. So the non-disclosure agreement protects you uh, for your character being uh, revealed in the event the artist ultimately declines working with you, right? So you get that form from a licensed attorney, attorney service like Legal Zoom, and secure that privacy if if needed. Which again, it shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, an artist who's professional understands the non-disclosure. If they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to see your unique character thing before I choose to work with you, they they should be okay with that as long as it's a fair non-disclosure agreement. All right, the character turn creation process. At this point, you've gotten your work for hire agreement signed, the initial payments have been made, the artist is ready to hear the full details for their character. For your character design, you should really have at least a thorough description of the character, their outfit, their accessories, like we talked about, example references to other comparatives which to help the artist. For example, if the character is in a military uniform, picture of someone in the army in an army uniform may help the artist see where you're going with the character. Just be careful with your signs. Make sure they're not copying another's work, right? The last thing you need is to get in trouble because your character looks like it has drawn too much from an existing character series. Um, that that could be a big problem. And plus, other people are going to then probably mock you or say, oh, that's a ripoff of X, you know, and, and it's just not going to be very fun. So you want to make sure that, you know, your character is original and has things unique enough to make them stand out. So. Again, when, when you're starting this off, you got to make sure the design does not infringe upon the intellectual property IP of another's work. I do not personally believe in or like IP. I know it sounds kind of unusual if, if you don't know my views. Otherwise, I don't believe in intellectual property as a concept. But whether I like it or not, IP law affects me and affects you. So you have to deal with that legal reality. Um, and so you know the government's laws are going to, through violent force, defend a creator's designs. Uh, so you have to be careful. So you have to make sure, again, that whatever your artist is putting together, even if you're very creative with it, that they're not themselves tracing another character and ripping off a design, that they're not just copying another artwork and then like modifying it slightly. Again, it happens. Ho hopefully it doesn't happen to you, but it can happen. A reverse Google image search might be able to help you, especially... You know, if it's not immediately apparent, sometimes you just got to throw what the artist draws for you into a Google image reverse search. And that might give you a sense of whether this may be too much <laughs> like someone else's or, or possibly been ripped off. So with the design process, the artist should give you some initial character sketches to help you see if you like the direction they're going in. If you like it, great, you're good to go. If not, you got to be as specific as possible, right? You might have to manually draw over what the artist has made, whether you print that out by draw by hand or in Photoshop. Just be as descriptive as possible. Again, whatever you do, just be kind and supportive, though, in, in that communication. You know, always have a kind word about what you like going first. It goes a long way uh, before talking about the adjustment. So, again, you want to, you know, couch anything that is an adjustment or criticism in a kind way because you want to have a building relationship with whoever you're working with you want this to be for the long term potentially you might be working with them again so you know tell them what you like that's going well first and then get into what needs to be adjusted 
So here's an example of an early draft proof in a secondary pencil sketch. This is a voluntarist. These are some of the initial sketches I received. The one that you can see um, on viewer left, that was the first uh, rough draft, just kind of like getting down some ideas. And then ultimately the second one that's on the right, that was what became the official voluntarist character. So again, the, the artist might give you some initial sketches and then you give some feedback and then eventually it gets turned into something that is the final drawing. There's also a sequential page, right? Layouts and edits. So this is a, a simple example here. I'll uh, expand this really quick so you can see. Um, but you know, the artist gives an artboard, they give some kind of rough drawings and then you give some edits, right? So I just typed out some edits like smaller wide window, there's a building in distance. Um, I noted that the helicopter will be moved back further and there's water behind. And you can see there, again, just using Photoshop, nothing crazy artwork wise, but just being able to put down some, some words and a little bit of color. Uh, I was able to give them some feedback enough to reach the final pencil page where things got to where I wanted them to be. Failure is an option. So it is possible that Despite all your best efforts to communicate clearly, find talent with work history and pay promptly, the artist's creation still isn't up to par. It happens. It's unfortunate. And one of the most common forms of happening is seeing the artist somehow do other people's art right. But for you, they just can't seem to capture the essence of what you want, right? You see them be like, oh man, you did this so right for this other person. How come you can't get my artwork right? It happens. If you fail the first time and you cannot get the artist to truly give you what you want, it's okay. You may have to take the loss and use that work product as an example for the next artist of what you do not like. Again, even if for whatever reason you couldn't get this artist to do it exactly right, now this is your chance to take what that artist made at that final stage and be like, okay, let me note what I don't like on this and where I want to go for the next artist. And maybe you find an artist that really has that style a little bit better and then they can really get it to where you want. So again, the most important thing you can do to set yourself up for success is not move forward until you're happy with the initial designs. Don't sell yourself short. If you, you know, don't feel that pressure, be like, oh my gosh, I just got to get, if, if you're feeling that, like, I got to get this done, you're, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to end up with something that doesn't look the way you want. And then you'll be miserable the rest of the way out. And you'll be spending your time fixing those mistakes. Learn from me. Don't do that. It will be painful. All right. So for your first turn, as I was mentioning before, you know, you Typically for character uh, mock-ups, you get someone who can do all the parts. Like it's, you know, especially more common when someone is a concept artist, but you could separate the penciler from the colorist. You could choose, you know, to get multiple artists. And if you do that, you got to tailor the first proposal to just the pencils and their digital links and then do another RFP for the colors, right? It's more common to find someone who's a penciler and digital anchor, like doing those two parts together, who could also do character colors. Um, but, you know, again, it's up to, you decide whether it be up to uh, uh, um, up to your standards of what you want to work with one person for the whole thing or to split it up. Um, so over the years for myself, I've you know worked with many who've been able to do colors for the character turns, even if their coloring skills were not as good as, as people who are just totally colorists, like that's all they do. But again, it's sufficient if it's just a mock-up and it's like, you know, they get the flats down, they get the basic details down. So it just depends on, on the artist and what your desires are. All right, once you have the first character turn complete, it's time to have the artist complete the other needed turns, the main characters featured in the first issue. It's a good pro uh, practice, too, for your artists as you're potentially writing them to create your comic book series sequential as well. You know, if, if you find the right artist for this and they're otherwise talented, they might be able to work with you on the, on the rest of the comic. You never know. So this could be good practice for them. Um, you ideally should complete all main characters needed for the first issue, make sure the continuity is maintained, right? You know, the main characters that will be recurring are really who you should have uh good or bad guys right protagonists or antagonists or both and you know you, you really want that solid right off the bat so that way you're ready to go on the next issue you have all these references you could show uh you know the artist and make sure that you know everything is staying with good continuity with good continuity all right budget limitations and character turns for some people they may not have the money to create all the needed character turns right off the bat I was one of those. I ran my initial comic campaign using only a single character sketch. That was rough, but I did it. And this was a mistake. I had to learn from that the hard way. While you may be able to save some money in other areas, the area to not skip on is with the protagonist character designs. If you do not do this right, you could doom the quality control of your project for years. Again, you've heard me say this many times at this point, 
but I need to say it many times because it is that important. It just is so important to get, especially your lead characters, their character designs down set perfectly right from the beginning so you have that exact reference to go off of every time and you can sit there and you can check and be like, oh, okay, this is off or, oh, you need to adjust his nose or whatever. You need that for yourself so you can give the artist adjustment um, notes in the event that they, you know, they do something off. The next best solution for someone tight of money is trying to get some initial support from friends or family for that initial drawing and then hosting an initial Indiegogo to raise support for the character turns. So again, I know I'm talking about crowdsource fundraising for your comic, and there's kind of loaded into this, this idea that you had a little bit of money to start to be able to get these character turns done before you go into the main comic. If you don't, you got to figure out how to get it somehow. Seriously, you, you know, talk to friends, talk to family, uh, save whatever it is. You got, you got to do it. It's, there's no way around this. You know, even I did uh, or funded in my own pocket, you know, some of those initial concept drawings, you, you just have to get it done. You can't just do the Indiegogo and not have <laughs> the character drawings. People are not going to want to support something that they don't even have like a basic sketch of the characters, you know, for they want to, they want to envision it. So you, you definitely need that. All right. After the character turns are complete, uh, it's time to think about how you'd like to proceed with your comic book campaign and publicity. Depending on your resources, you may be able to create an entire comic book before you even launch a crowdsource funding raising campaign, right? Some people have the money to, to start, right? Some people are like, yeah, I have like $4,000, $2,000, and I can get this going beforehand. Okay, if you can do that, great. Some people don't. Some people are on a more limited budget. Like, nope, I definitely need to crowdsource fundraise in order to get this going. So whether you can create all or none of the comic beforehand, using crowdsource fundraising method is a great promotional opportunity to help you get the word out about your series. So regardless of whether you can afford to create beforehand or not, crowdsource fundraising is an amazing way to actually pump your series up because it creates a lot of uh, publicity for yourself. So again, why crowdsource fundraising? There's public visibility for your comic book project to new audiences. So again, it's on a crowdsource fundraising site so now it's getting serviced in that feed you might end up in one of their promotional letters or emails um you know people can stumble across it incidentally or intentionally whatever it's it's there it's it's public it's it's getting out to new faces right as opposed to a standalone website that no one would have a reason to navigate to um it offers others a way to buy into the series with the exciting pitch unique perks right if you have a crowdsource fundraising page you can sell people on that when people are like oh what new projects are here on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, whatever, or uh, fund my comic. People are like, oh, okay, what's new? Oh, and you know, and you have a pitch opportunity. Um, there's public accountability with timelines and updates, right? So that's pretty cool to show people. Be like, hey, we're producing this. Here's our timeline. I'm going to be able to give you updates here and, and show you the progress. People like that. People like a way to engage with your process. Um, there's secured funding to be able to move on forward to creating your your comic book, right? So. By virtue of using crowdsource fundraising, you could potentially raise um, enough to cover what you've already paid into it. And then some, it may allow you to fund the next one, right? Like that publicity from it and that fundraising from it could help kick you off your next issue. You know, it's just really great to be able to have that. You know, even if you could fund this yourself entirely for a first issue, you know, having that publicity and opportunity for creating a fan base is a pretty big deal. And then, of course, the media publicity from the campaign itself could also go beyond just the the platform, right? Uh, depending on how you you pitch it, and how you how you do it, there might be people who write articles about it just in the indieverse of things. There might be uh, local stories, um, you know, if, especially if you go to uh, a local paper and you're okay being public with it. You know, you could have a story written about you in the newspaper about your project potentially. You know, there's there's ways that you can get your story to a wider audience because of the excitement and publicity and the media opportunity that comes with having a crowdsource fundraising campaign. So what do you need to set up an Indiegogo or alternatively like a, a fundmycomic.com, which fundmycomic is, is, is newer. Um, and I, I add them in specifically because they are a free speech oriented platform. I haven't even used them yet. I'm just throwing it out there because I think it's worth letting people know about. I've been an Indiegogo user diehard for over 10 years. And um, I, I'm not sure if I'll shift away from that yet, but I, I am, tempted to because of fundmycomic.com. So I just wanted to throw that in there too. So no matter what though, whatever platform you use, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, fundmycomic, whatever, you're going to need a pitch video. Typically you want a video that tells people about what you're trying to do and the story. Uh, you need some graphics to show off your concepts and your content, right? Maybe character drawings, perk images, artful displays of what you know, people are going to get. You want campaign text going over your story plot and the campaign goals. And you need consistent updates to backers to inform them of developments. 
The pitch video for your campaign is what explains what you hope to raise and use it for. So not everyone has a voice or face that's great for camera. Look, let's just be real. It's, you know, it comes with territory, right? Not everybody feels comfortable being on camera, showing their face. That's okay, though. It, you don't have to uh, be comfortable. Um, you could hire a voiceover artist on Fiverr to do a quick one-minute pitch of, you know, for your campaign for you. You can hire a professional presenter to do so. There's, you know, on Fiverr, they actually have people who will um, act as your you know, video presenter and they'll read off your script. So you could hire somebody else if you're genuinely not comfortable. Typically, though, people do like to hear at least from the person who's the writer producer. They like to see them. It's a part of building trust. It's a part of connecting with the audience. So again, if you can muster up your internal emotional strength and just do it, even if it's just for one minute, just to you know thank people, say, hey, here's what we're doing. I appreciate your support. Excited to make this, whatever. You just, getting that connection is a pretty big deal. But understandably, if for whatever reason you can't, there are alternatives. But you don't have to be fancy though. Um, you know, a lot of times people want to be like, oh my gosh, I got to be super crazy professional, huge studio, this, like you don't have to. So don't, don't think you need to throw that much money at it. You know, all you just need is clean audio and halfway decent video, which could be done with a cell phone these days. Like most people's cell phones are good enough for that. You just got to get your, your lighting right. So if you have a low budget, it's simple. You just, you face your window midday. So you're well lit. You know, you got that nice natural lighting. You just stand your cell phone on a stand up or up, right? And then you record um, yourself speaking to the, to the phone. Right. Typically, phones will balance your audio pretty well. If everything's quiet, doors shut, you'll have even lighting. You know, that's all you need. Nothing crazy uh, just to do a quick pitch video. Um, if you have more video production experience, of course, you can you could take it up if, you, if you're able to. And, you know, it looks good. You know, you could have a nicer video camera. You could have a walk and talk video if you can afford someone to shoot you, whatever. Um, but whatever it is, you should be excited on camera, right? You should look like you're really excited for this project. You should definitely be enthusiastic because again, that enthusiasm is going to carry over to your backers. You know, if you feel happy and excited, they're going to feel that same kind of spirit of joy too. Right. So, um, you want to, you know, have a close that gets people to action. You want to actually get people getting their perks. So you want to keep that video short one to three minutes tops, you know, these days, you know, even closer to one minute because, you just don't want people to get bored and to, you know, click away, right? You really just want, here's the pitch. Here's exciting. Check it out. Here's what we got. Boom. I'll see, you know, down there. And you want people getting over to getting the perk, right? You don't, you don't want to waste any more time than necessary. You want them to become backers quickly. Um, if you do have greater creative interests, though, you could do a skit or a cosplay teaser. You could make a motion comic, which is where you have, if you've already created some of the pages of the comic, you could have them animated by, you know, someone Fiverr has lots of motion comic animators. Um, you could even have a full animation if you have that kind of budget, but that's kind of next level. Um, and I've, I personally have done pretty much every kind of method. I've done the skits. I've done the cosplaying. I've made trailers and special effects. I did an independent presenter. I've done voiceover. And I've even done my own form of animation. So I, I've done it all. And I got to tell you, none of them particularly stuck out as necessarily being that much more um, successful than the others really overall um, in terms of like generating a uh, support and interest. I would say the thing that mattered the most was whether or not what I presented was exciting and just the audio was clean and clear and, and that kind of thing. Right. So again, you, making a trailer, you can make it exciting. If you got the talents for it, you can make it a little you know, teaser with, with action and acting. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, and, and if done right, it can be fun. Uh, but again, it's not required, right? You, you can kick off your campaign with a simple, straightforward, uh, just little pitch, one-on-one -on -one simple discussion with the phone camera as long as the audio is clear and you know you're you're well lit or whatever you can do it so don't worry about it you're making a comic book right you you're not making a movie so remember that you're making a comic book you're not making a movie all right so once you've drafted up a rough idea for a pitch it's time to think about the content of the indiegogo or whatever else you're using fund my comic or whatever i recommend you complete the main content of the indiegogo first before recording the pitch as that may inspire language for the video including what may offer the perks. The campaign should cover at least the series overview, a basic bio uh, of you, the writer uh, slash producer, uh, the goals of the campaign, what the goal of the series is, details for any nuances and perks slash delivery, calls to action with ways people can help, right? So you want to make sure you have all the basics in there about what people need to know about your project, what it's specifically talking about the story, 
Um, and ways people can, you know, join in and help. Like, even if it's like, hey, you know, you can't donate that much, or it's not donate, but support that much for the perk purchase, you know, telling them, hey, share this to social media, tell your friends about it, right? Even stuff like that. People are like, oh, okay, you know, I can help that way. I can only get five bucks or something, but, you know, let me share this online. So um, depending on your resources and abilities, sometimes you can even include in that campaign description the teamwork in the comic if you're set who's doing the artwork. I, I don't personally do this. I tend to keep that information uh, business confidential. Uh, some do do it though with great success because it personalizes the campaign and makes others feel more confident project. Like sometimes just having, here's my primary artist, here's my colorist, and here's a little bio about them. You know, some people do that. I think it can work. I think it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not absolutely needed, uh, but up to you again. And then the stretch goals, um, if there are uh, bonuses past the main goal, like let's just say you end up going past 100%, you might be able to offer stretch goals. So you could list those there either before or afterward, um, after you break that point. And then other artwork or mock-ups to help visualize the comic universe. So again, if you have any drafts that you've made or any sketches, you might include that there just to give people a sense of what it's about. And now the perks. So campaign perks typically involve at least the print copy of the comic with some bonus item like a sticker art print, right? That's the most typical thing, right? Print copy, hey, comic book, I'm producing this. That's what people are there for. Um, the perks you can offer will depend, of course, on your resources and abilities. Over the years, I have gone from offering many kinds of complex perks, custom t-shirts, figures, and all kinds of stuff, to focusing solely on comics, stickers, and art prints. Um, now I'm going to give you some, some warnings about what you should or shouldn't do uh, coming up here. So you really want to be mindful of the costs and risks of the perks you offer because the more complex the more risk you face. So let's let's get into some details here, right? Remember that whatever you offer, you're gonna have to make and you're gonna have to ship. So don't forget that, you know, just cause you think something's cool to make, that, oh, that's gonna make that easy to get to people, right? You should avoid perks early on that are expensive because it's gonna eat up your production budget, right? You're, you're spending all this money on making the product and now you have nothing left for your comic. That's a bad time. Um, you don't want stuff that's easily broken in the mail right? It looks bad if you send people something that breaks, you're going to look really terrible, right? If stuff's breaking in shipments. So you want to be careful about stuff that easily breaks. And especially things that are heavy to ship, right? If it's a very heavy item, um, that's going to dramatically increase costs. So if you're trying to send people like heavy magnets or like some metal little statue thing, I mean, it, you know, you could really be driving up your costs and it, it's just a real pain. Not good for a first campaign. So the best perks to start with are those that you can reasonably afford to pick up without issue and that will not be easily damaged or weigh down your package, right? Your typical stuff like comic books, stickers, art photos that is prints of artwork, art flyers like little cardstock, smaller you know, cardstock, game cards or cardboard tokens, again, very thin things, thin PVC or cloth patches, stuff that can easily go into a mailer and, and be no problem bookmarks, those kinds of things. Just anything that could readily fit into a flat mailer that's sized about nine by 12 inches, right? Which is uh, roughly around, you know, what your uh, USPS flat rate mailer is. You, you need something that can go into a nice flat package, not cause you any problems, not readily break. So stuff that you don't want to do early because it's big risk, big cost or action figures they're expensive to make and hard to ship, right? I mean, the action figure production process on just the basics can cost six, ten thousand dollars easily. It is, it can eat up your entire budget. Just try to make that on a first campaign. Not a good thing to do. Mugs, right? They're cool, but fragility issue, right? Mugs can break. Acrylic or plastic items that are again brittle, they can snap in the mail, like keychains. I've shipped plastic keychains and I've had them break and I'm like, oh well, that didn't work out. Uh, T-shirts even. T-shirts are super cool, and they are somewhat easy to ship in some cases, but they can be a pain, especially when you're trying to pack that with a comic book. Again, you know, T-shirts, they take up some space. Again, they're not the worst of the, the things that are risky, but again, what are you trying to make here? T-shirts or comic books, right? T-shirts are kind of taking it out of there. They might be good on a second campaign. They might be good if you have, you know, a good way to pack them, but... You just want to avoid things that require special packaging or special construction costs that quickly eat up your comic budget. So some of the best places to create affordable bonus perks are Vistaprint, uh, Zazzle, Amazon for photos, the Game Crafter. Um, if you want like uh, special art cards or like you know card deck items that are you know thin and easy to print, 
But again, don't get lost and try and do everything. Keep the perks simple. Keep them affordable. Keep them fun. If they can fit in your 9 by 12 flat mailer easily, great. Um, if not, just move on, at least for the first round. Again, it's so easy to get caught up to me. Like, I got to be like everybody else. I got to be like the big guys. I got to make lunch boxes. I got to, you know, you're going to get lost not making the comic book series and developing that, you know, and trying to get everything done. It's just not worth it. Those are things that are expansion items. That's when you're getting more successful. Now, I did those things and I, and I, you know, I did it and there were some good things about it. But again, it, it took away from my production. It did. It really did. And, as much as it was fun to make some different items, you know, and other physical parks and shirts and stuff like that. And again, some of them are cool doing that right after that was not as wise. I should have waited a bit longer. So again, focus on making a good comic, focus on getting that done and getting that shipped. And then maybe by your second, third, fourth campaign, maybe you can start bringing in those extra cool things like the t-shirts, right? And then maybe by your third or fourth campaign, maybe you're raising enough to make an action figure. But again, pro you know, probably not, not typically. All right, setting your perk prices. Um, your perk prices are very important because you have to account for your costs of your perks and other fees and ship it, right? So on Indiegogo, at least, you know, the perks and the shipping are calculated toward your goal. So that is the price you're paying for shipping counts toward your goal amount, what the, you know, the amount you're trying to raise. So if you have a $20 comic and $5 for shipping, $25 is credited toward your campaign goal. So you have to keep that in mind that your goal is uh, now also reflecting your shipping too. So your shipping price is not nuanced by the customer um, on there at least, and, and pretty much for any other crowdsource platform, it's 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 difficult to get um, you know any type of very specific granular pricing, like not by state. And sometimes you can do by breaking down by country, but it's it gets really complicated. So a lot of times you're just going to set generic standard for shipping that approximates your costs, right? So kind of like a range. Um, you don't really get to the more advanced shipping stuff until you have more developed technology. But again, in the beginning, you're just best off kind of setting a generic price um, you know, for your US side and then for everybody else around the world kind of thing. Otherwise, it, it can just get really tricky. And again, it should be well above what your 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 costs are to overall just to make sure you have that wiggle room for issues. So again, your perk price overall should represent um, the supporting of the creation of your comic, right? Like your, the Indiegogo and crowdsource fundraising is not, uh, just purely the sales thing where it's like, oh, okay, I'm just selling the raw product. Here's my dollar to dollar profit. No, it's supposed to be people are consciously supporting your creation of the comic. So again, it's okay to have higher prices and higher margins here. And you're offering unique perks to justify that, to give them special unique things from the campaign, special stickers or bookmarks or whatever. But the goal is, is to help you actually produce this. So, you know, that's what's unique about this crowdsource fundraising is that it's specifically meant to enable you to have production. So err on the high side, don't err on the low side. You will you will really regret that, right? Err on the high side of prices because at the end of the day, you know, you have to pay for all those expenses and you're better to have a little bit extra than it be a little bit under and not be able to afford your production. So I tend to keep the price of the perk plus shipping at, at least five to six times uh, less than the financial, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, um, the price of the perk and the shipping five to six times um, more than the financial cost, that's less, but it meant to say more. Without this, I like, would not have any budget with, with which to hire artists to make the comic. So you can increase your margins with low-cost add-ons like offering signed copies or signed art prints. So again, there's ways that you can do add-ons um, to be able to justify a price increase, that kind of thing. Um, but again, the, the whole point is to be able to fund the creation. So there's nothing wrong with that here. Um, your perk description should include the general description of the items, the included items list, Estimated delivery date, any special notes about park rules, mention the campaign body. A reminder, provide the correct email slash mailing address because people uh, need that reminder several times to make sure they are careful when uh, putting it down. So, you know, I, I do this several times. I'll tell people, hey, uh, make sure you have your correct mailing address, please. Because no matter what, there's always a few people that for whatever reason, they put down the wrong number or they skip a digit and then I got to track them down and figure out what it was supposed to be. But it's okay. Remind people several times, hey, just double check your mailing address. Make sure you put that in right. It'll save us time. It'll save you know, a headache from trying to track down where, when your perk went to the wrong place. 
Now that you have a sense of the campaign basics, time to think about your goal amount. Your goal uh, campaign goal should at a minimum be able to fully account for the cost to produce the comic, right? That's everything from the artwork design to the print copy itself. Cost of the fill the perks, right? We're talking about the, the shipping, shipping materials, you know, creation of, of all that uh, packaging stuff. Um, the platform fees, whether it's, you know, Indiegogo, Fund My Comic, whatever else. Um, there's, you know, a 5% fee for Indiegogo. There's also credit and debit card fees, right? So when people use their cards, there's going to be 1% to 3% roundabout fees. So you really have to factor that in. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll factor it as like a, just an overall 10%, like a 10% of campaign goal might go to platform plus credit card fees just to, you know, be above and beyond and like really try to account for what risks and issues could come up. So again, always, uh, make sure that you, you do a higher air on the higher side of your budget. And if you fail to account for any of these things, you're going to have some drastic consequences because, again, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh, this costs so much more than what I thought I was going to. So let's look at some sample expenses just for fun, right? Cost of a completed a digital comic page, you know, pencils, inks, colors, letters. Let's just say it's 150 You hired international on all of it. The cost of the covers, 200 Covers sometimes are a little special, a little extra. Cost per copy of comic, 250 which is pretty low now considering how much prices have gone up. Cost of mailing materials per mailer is 50 cents, maybe. You know, if you have backing board, you have a special cover mailer, maybe you have, you know, something else in there to protect it, whatever. Cost of shipment per average comic mailer, $3. You know, just saying a generic flat rate, let's just say. So a 24 page comic could cost $3,800 just for the digital artwork, right? That's not including all the costs for the promotional art, character, and physical books and shipping. A typical comic book campaign of a 24 page industry standard medium quality comic book will cost you four to $6,000 when factoring all costs. And that doesn't even include money for one's own personal profit or you know reinvestment. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to have to have a budget that's going to cover all of these things. You know what I mean? You're going to need to make sure, okay, my campaign goal is $6,000 or $8,000, whatever it is to actually cover these things. Unless you have the money yourself and you're willing to take the loss as a risk. And some people do that. Some people just list their campaign at the bottom amount for success, like 500 bucks minimum. And they do it because, well, I already produced it. And, you know, I just want to show that we can get some support. And it can work. It can help, you know, pump up some metrics. But you do want to keep that in mind, especially if you do need that money and you're you're not just simply doing this crowdsource fundraising with most or all the comic already done. So, you know, do what you can to take your projected expenses, put into Word table, Excel sheet, whatever makes sense for you, budget accordingly, right? Write down everything that you can to figure out what these expenses are. Um you know, of course, you can save some money if you're able to work on any of these major elements yourself, right? Like, let's just say you're able to do letters or you're able to, you know, do inks, whatever it is. Maybe you could save some money on one of these elements. Um, but your typical comic writer producer, typically the people who are watching this, they're not doing the primary art. So be sure to figure out what's in your capabilities and what's not, right? So for me, eventually I got to the point where I could do letters. So I could save a little bit of money there doing letters, but you may not be able to do that. Your campaign is nearing launch ready when you finish the campaign description, the pitch video perk list, and the goal number, right? Once you've kind of gotten these elements down that we just talked about, okay, now you're you're in the you're nearing the finish line here. So duration of campaign, well, you know, some people do 30 days, some people do up to 60. I personally do 60. I think it's necessary to maximize promotion and funding, right? Some people need two months where they see it and like, oh, okay, I'm gonna save up for for something. They might, you know, need time to save money. They might need time to see it several times before I finally by the, the bullet and, and join. I just think that the longer is typically better uh, for a campaign when you can when you can actually take the time to, to build up interest and build up publicity and get people to possibly even like save up and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to get this next month because I want to save up to get a bigger perk. Turnaround time for your perks. So uh, typical freelancing artists, right? You need to think about what they're going to need time-wise to finish things. You, you have to ask them, of course, too, and see what they can do. So you can have that for your contract, but they typically create one to two sequential pages per week. And that might seem like really low, but again, if you're talking about a freelancer, a freelancer it might have many clients at once and they're bouncing around a bunch of projects. So, you know, they, they may not be able to do as many. Um, that's just, you know, just being realistic. So if you have a 24 page comic, and you're just starting production after that's three months right there, just for the pencils. If inks and colors are separate, then you got to have to add on more time. So inks and colors traditionally take less time because they're working with the pre-existing framework, right? They're, they're kind of filling in what's, what's already there. 
So, um, you know, you still want to add another buffer though, of three months for them too, to be extra safe. Uh, lettering is usually fast with letters being letters being able to do three to six pages per day. Cause again, lettering is just not as time extensive, unless you have like a really crazy artistic letterer who does like custom artwork on the letters and the bubbles and stuff. But you, you know, letters usually can move a lot faster. So just give yourself a month there to be safe typically. Um, the shipment of printed comics, if you're using Kablam, which we'll talk about later, depends on how uh, booked they are with conventions. I've had comic turn around as quickly as four weeks, as long as four months. Always predict the latest and work with that. So for a 24-page comic book that you start working on after your campaign funds dispersed, you should be planning eight to 12 months for the delivery date, with later being the first choice for first-timers. So if you're a first-time campaign person, you probably should set your delivery date for a year from close. And that might sound crazy, but like, whoa, a whole year for one comic? That's crazy. Yeah, but guess what? You're a first timer. You have to learn the ropes. You're going to have to figure out how long it takes for all these artists. And you need to give yourself as much time as possible for revisions, unexpected things that come up. You need to do your best to under promise and over deliver because people would rather you say, oh, I'm going to deliver a year from now. And you end up delivering in eight months. Then you say, oh, I'll deliver in eight months. And then you're three months late. You look bad. No matter what, even if it's reasonable that something happened or came up, someone got sick and died, like that happened to one of my uh, letters in the past, they actually passed, sadly. Um, you know, even if it's reasonable, your backers are going to still be like, oh, well, why isn't this delivered on time? So you always want to under promise and over deliver. Make sure you give yourself extra buffer room. You're always going to be favored by delivering early than delivering late. So before you go ahead and schedule launch delivery time, there are a few more tasks to do so you can improve your chance for success. Um, you want to get buy-in from friends and family first. Um, so, you know, it's it's common that when you first start your own campaign, uh, your friends and family might be some of your first supporters because you're like, hey, I want to do this creative project and they, they believe in you first kind of thing, right? Before you're big or known, uh, you know, possibly, especially if you don't have any other social media pages that you're known on, um, it might be your friends and family who help give you that initial push. Um, you also might want to get an email letter, uh, an email list ready for outreach, um, and that could be getting emails from friends or, or people you're connected with on social media, or asking people to sign up um, uh, who would like to know about the comic because Indiegogo has that where they have an email list sign up, or you might use Mailchimp and get people to sign up there. But you want to look proactively for comic book sponsors if you're planning to do advertisement. Um, that's something you can have in advance too. Start feeling out who might want to advertise your comic. Uh, advertising preparation there, you know, just uh, getting those pages formatted to tell people, hey, here's what a one page comic or a double page comic ad could look like. And then there's, of course, press coverage consideration, right? Maybe you're reaching out to get featured on some indie comic podcast. Maybe you're letting your local newspaper know about your series because you don't mind, you know, being known locally for that thing. Yeah, you know, there's, there's ways to, to get some publicity there. So buying from friends and family, again, they're the first rung of supporters who can help you kick off your campaign. You should tell your friends and family early when you plan to launch, make a group even, and we, you know, to let them know when it goes live, you know, it's an email a chain, face a group, phone, text group, something like that, whatever it is. Just if you have good relationships with friends and or family, you should be able to break the ice in this campaign by telling them, hey, this is my dream project. I want to make this happen. And quite a few of them might even pick up a copy, that kind of thing, or share it. So you'll get some viral traction that way by getting some friends and family to buy in. Um, with the email list, again, you might have contacts over the years. You might have lists from the project. Uh, you might have something from fans of other, cover, of other comics that you can leverage. Um, you might do this by sending out batches of emails like directly. So maybe you just send a personalized email uh, to 50 to 100 people a day until you run out. Um, that's a way to get you know people uh, onboarded just by sending them a personal email. Um, you could also, uh, put in there that, you know, if you don't want to be content about this to remove them so that they don't get angry at you and there could be legal issues there too. You could talk with a lawyer, but basically, um, if it's, if it's a personal email, just a one off, you might be okay. But if it's on a subscription thing, well, they need to be able to unsubscribe and certain services also don't like it. If you add in people who didn't opt in like MailChimp. So you gotta be careful about that. But again, if you're messaging 50 to hundred personal contacts and you're saying, Hey, Frank, I just want to let you know about this is a one-off personal email should be okay. Um, there's, uh, you know, advertisements that can push up your funding. Um, you know, it's an easy way to get outside support. Um, those who might be friends or family with the business promoter or podcast or creator who you're engaged with, um, that might be interesting. Maybe you follow 
uh, someone on Patreon. Like you might have um, some comic book uh, reporter that you follow on Patreon. You're like you let them know about your project. Like, hey, I've been a long time Patreon supporter, three years, something like that. And you're like, I'm, I have this new project. I just want to know, would you like to interview me? Would you like to have an advertisement? You know, there's there's ways you can you can uh, reach out to them. Just make sure your inquiry email is professional as it's a professional request, especially if you're reaching out to a business or a podcast or a creator. Uh, here's a little example. It says, a dear big comic podcast crew, this is Jack Stevens and I've been a Patreon supporter of your cast for three years now. I love what you guys cover and was curious if you'd be interested in placing an ad for your show, my new comic book series, Captain Create a Comic. This is my first comic book project, but I've taken the time to study up on the best practices and have a stellar art team lined up for production. I know how much you guys love covering indie comics, so I thought this would be a great opportunity. If you want to interview me for your show, I'd be happy to come as well. You can check out the comic series campaign synopsis set, and then you put your link, and you go to a link, and the ad sponsor perk on the right-hand side bar there. If you have any questions or thoughts about my project, you reach me at you know the email. Either way, keep your great work, and thank you for all you do. Sincerely, Jay. Right. So again, just a little email can go a long way, especially if you're connected or know of um, a certain podcast or your Patreon supporter of a creator that might interview you. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask and just see what's happening. Again, you, and just noting here, you keep it short, you keep it sweet, you keep it personal, let the campaign do your talking. And if you don't hear back right away, no worries. Give it a few weeks. You can do one more follow-up, you know, if you're really interested in them as a potential sponsor. Otherwise, you know, move on to more prospects. Um, in addition to the uh, advertisement prep, um, you know, you can do advertisement uh, that is for your project, not just getting advertisement in the comic. But you should be careful because if you're not too savvy on advertisement yourself, you could waste some money on it. So you want to make sure that if you're running like a Facebook ad or Twitter ad, you want to make sure you you're doing it in the right way. If you already have an existing like engaged audience, like maybe you have a Facebook page or personality page it might be easier then. Cause it's like, you already have people tuned in. You can advertise directly to them, but if you don't have anything, it's just a wide net advertisement. That could be hard to do, right? Especially without a professional advertising service that helps you with it. So, you know, it's tough. It might not work out as well, you know, especially if your comic is more niche. Um, so again, if, if you have your own personality page, your own thing that makes sense to promote your project, great. You know, you can promote it to that audience, to people who like your page already. Uh, but if not, you know, be careful. And then the press coverage aspect here, um, you know, the most likely reason you would get covered, you know, if you're in a local paper, it might be a cool feature story, just a local feature story. Indie comic podcasts, again, um, they love covering new projects, so make it easy for them. If there's indie comic podcasts that cover indie comics, head them up, see what's going on. There's also blogs as well, so there could be uh, you know blog or news articles. I've had that happen several times in my project. I've appeared in many different indie uh, comic blogs, so see what'll come up. All right, so before you launch... Make sure you've addressed each of the following issues. Again, let's check over our checklist. Did you make sure to list all the important deals, details about the product's mission, scope, rules, and delivery dates? Have you proofread your campaign and ensure everything is correct, both substantively and grammatically? Have you set a proper goal amount to cover your expenses and desired profit? Have you checked your perks to ensure the descriptions are accurate and the delivery date is reasonable with enough padded time for emergencies? Again, emergencies can happen. Over, uh, uh, you should say, uh, under promise and over deliver. Give yourself extra time. Have you let your friends and family know of your product so they can support it when it launches, right? That's going to be your probable first big backers or friends and family when you're brand new to the scene. They'll be the ones that give you that initial seed, get your virality going that pushes you up in the metrics, and then other people might catch on and see it, you know, as it comes up, you know, in the rankings for a new project. So if you said yes to all those things, then you've met the bare minimum of what's needed to hit that launch button, right? Double check again that you put in your bank account information correctly too. <laughs> you definitely want to make sure your bank account's right and whatever you use, Indiegogo or Find My Comic, whatever. Uh, some things you could change in the campaign, like in the content, you can update things within there even after you launch. You can update perks if no one's bought it yet. Um, but that bank account information is fixed. So you better you better triple, quadruple, have some, a second set of eyes, you know, whether it's a you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse, whatever, double check that bank account. Someone's safe, of course. You know, maybe a sibling. Make sure that number is in there right before you, you, you launch. So once you hit the launch button, your campaign has entered the active promotional zone. During this time, it's up to you to keep the hype train going, right? So now you're launched, but you got to keep that hype train going. So you're going to be proactive in sending out emails, letting everyone know what you got going on through your social media channels, whatever you got. Uh, backer updates uh, are important as well, uh, not just simply posting out your project on Facebook or Twitter or wherever else, but also letting the backers know what's going on. However, 
You don't want to overload them, right? Uh, backers, they want to hear about successes and bonuses, but they don't want to be updated in every little thing, right? You don't need to be sending them a message. Oh, we got a new backer this morning, this or that. You know, you really want to not overwhelm their email so they don't get mad at you. <laughs> um, so you can make an update when you've hit the halfway point to let backers know where the campaign's at. That's, you know, halfway is great. I'll make an update if you're telling them that you're doing something noteworthy, right? Like if you're going to have a live stream promotion, say, hey, we're going to be going live, whatever Friday, come on, hang with us. That's fine. Uh, if you're get interviewed in a big podcast or a paper and you want to let people know like, hey, we got covered. People like hearing that. Uh, make an update Update if you hit goal, right? Obviously you hit 100%. Let everybody know, hey, we hit goal. Um, make an update when you're coming close to the end of campaign, right? You want to let them know that the campaign's ending in a week and then ending in 24 hours. So that way they can share it one last time. Maybe they want to get an extra perk, whatever. It's, it's a good thing to do. And of course, if you're in the stretch goal zone, you hit 100% and now you're going above and you're like, okay, we'll do stretch goals. Make sure to update your backers and let them know that stretch goals are becoming unlocked and that when you hit certain levels, your bonuses are going to be unlocked. So the updates, again, they're going to people already back to believe in you. So you just want to leverage their interest um, and reminding them what's good and what's going on so that they continue to share the campaign or maybe upgrade their perk if they want more things, especially if you hit stretch goals. And if you're still not sure what stretch goals are, they are when you've hit 100% of your campaign's goal and you're offering more bonus perks to backers to continue support. But same rules apply, as I said before, about making stretch goals and adding things. Don't stretch yourself thin on stretch goals. Don't go and be like, I'm going to do an extra whole other comic right away or, or something where it's like going to kill your budget. Don't, don't do that. Don't hurt your shipping costs either by making something unreasonable. Like we're going to do an action figure now and you've only gotten up a thousand above, you know, your, your goal. It's not smart. Um, you want to start with a simple bonus, right? I typically say maybe you do a thousand, if you hit a thousand over the, the goal, add in something that's lower cost, like an art print or a, an extra sticker or something that's not costly to make, right? You can get an artist to make a sticker and art print and it costs a hundred, two hundred dollar arena between the, the perk and the cost of the art. And then it's nothing to add into the perk package, right? When you put a sticker in or you put a little art print in, that's that's not crazy to fit in with a comic book. Um, this is just some sample stretch goals. So in the past, you know, I did a, uh, an Agora character sheet. So a character sheet turn, uh, I did a team art print, right? So basically I did some straightforward stretch goals that are cool things to have, cool art pieces to have, but don't overwhelm me with, with extra costs that would kill, eat up my budget and, you know, kill my project. All right, so formatting for Kablam Printing. So Kablam is a print-on-demand comic book publishing service based out of Orlando, Florida. It's been in business since 2005. They also have their own uh, online storefront, Indie Planet, where creators can sell their own comic books in phys physical and digital format with their print-on-demand services. They put over 2 million comic books into print. So printing the, with them is straightforward once you understand the basic rules. So Kablam is the service that I have been using and still recommend overall. And again, the reason why Kablam sticks out is that they have that print on demand. So not only can you publish with them, in other words, get it printed for your needs, but they will list it and you can make royalty printing comics on demand. Not as many people do this, like Comics Wellspring doesn't have that for physical uh, options. But I mean, again, there are other pu publishers out there, but very few are actually going to have you be able to have your comic for print on demand, not just digital read on demand, but print on demand where anybody can buy your book and you earn royalty. So that's why I still like Kablam and Indie Planet. So Kablam requires that all standard comic pages are fitted to their template. Their template's available on their website. Um, and I can uh, link to it down below. Uh, the document size is 7, point, uh, 7 times 10.5 inches or 7 by 10.5 inches. They have a trim area, live area, and dots per inch is 300. So the trim area, the live area, that's basically saying where the comic book uh, can get cut off because they're cutting out these pages. So you have to be careful and you want to keep all your primary artwork and the bubbles within that live area, that blue, right? You want it to go full bleed all the way out, like that has reached the edges, you know, just so it goes to the edge, but you want to make sure that nothing important gets cut off. So again, it's critical that you make sure your artwork extends to the edge of the page and it's called full bleed. You want to make sure your primary art and text stays within that live area, that blue area, so that does not accidentally get cut off. Common mistake for newbies, they have artists start working for them. The artist is working a canvas. The artist doesn't fit it to the, um, the template properly. And then your artwork is getting cut off on the edge or there's edge lines that are extra. You know, 
You don't want to have this happen. So you avoid this happening by giving this template directly to the artist. So they have the file to work on top of, right? You got to send this file to your artist. Don't let them work without it because without this template file from Kablam, they can easily make a mistake. So let's take a look at mistakes, right? Learn from mistakes. So I had a cover back in the day. This is my eye not catching it, but this cover that was a very limited edition, it was a short uh, thing, didn't have a properly formatted edge. And it came out with this little uh, turquoise edge that didn't fit the, the to the full bleed properly. That was bad. So don't do that. Make sure that it fits properly to full bleed, right? So this is many years later. That's, you know, like almost over nine years ago. That happened almost 10 years now, actually. Um, this is the sixth issue of Origins. So my, everything's been good for the, my Origins series. So everything's been done right. But um, this is properly formatted. As you can see, the artwork goes all the way to the edge. The main primary elements are fully within here. They're not cut off. And, uh, you know, all you're doing to do that is having your artist draw all the way out to the red. So it's completely filled, but the main art is staying within the blue. That is the most critical parts are staying within the blue. So Kablam uh, has lots of options here for different types of uh, formatting. Um, so on their website, uh, and this is, you know, where it says, you know, create their comic book, they have uh, different sizes. You could do standard size or manga. They have different covers. Your interiors, you can do full color, black and white, page count. And, uh, you know, you have your name, a comic. You can do a back cover where it's like Kablang is, has an ad on there. Of course, you don't have to do that. But, they, you know, they have a lot of options for you to think about. Um, the title and issue number, this is what you will uh, name your book. So, uh, you know, you're going to put specifically what the name of the book is. In my case, it was, you know, Voluntarist Origin 6. That was uh, this one. Uh, the size will determine which template format you'll be using. The standard size comic book is the traditional American comic book size you're used to seeing in comic book stores. So that's what I use. We're not covering manga magazine formatting because uh, I'm not doing that type of format. And this is about comic books. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to discuss that. But again, they have it there if you want to do a manga style. Interiors, you can choose full color, black and white. Um, interior page count has a, a big warning here. Uh, so the interior page count is the pages... Uh, numbers, uh, the, the number of pages inside, excluding the interior side to the cover and the interior side to the back. So when you have a cover here, and just show this real quick. Wah. Um, yeah, actually, I'll the other side of this. So when you have this cover here, right, this is the interior to the cover, right? So your page count doesn't include this interior to the cover or um, what's on the back inside of the, of the back, right? It's only the, the pages inside. So you technically have the interior page count plus a page for the interior of the front and the interior of the back. That's a big deal because you need to fill in those pages with something, right? You could leave it blank, but typically you want to put something in there just to make use of the space, like, you know, kind of a, a credits or thank you page. So if you choose a 24 uh, page comic, for example, um, you actually have 26 pages of interior space, including that front uh, reverse of the cover in the back. So you got to make sure you choose the correct number of pages and you have something to fill for those, you know, as desired. And as I showed, you know, those interior cover pages are often a spot to place information about the comic series. You can thank backers, especially make a perk for thanking backers. You know, great opportunity. Um, and that here's a digital of that. Like, as I just showed you in the book, it's a demonstration of what one may do. You know, here I have a little bit about the story, the artwork, you know, a link to the website, thanks to the backers and, and a little bit of, uh, teaser content um then the back you could put a kablam ad so you could cut down your cost by having a kablam ad on the back cover but i don't i prefer to actually have on my back artwork but up to you um you know it's just a way to save money if you want you could even sell ad space yourself if you want you could sell ad space for the back cover but again up to you double page spread so kablam um also has a double page spread template option for the standard American template uh, um, that is uh, the standard American comic book and a double page. And I'll show you here just what that looks like uh, interior wise. So a double page spread is where the comic book page is going across two pages, right? So it's a singular artwork going across two pages. So, it's useful for center folds, especially, you know, if you want in the middle of the comic to have a double page spread, you could use it as advertisement or art. 
But you have to be careful. You have to manually count these pages to make sure that it is in the right place. So, you know, a way to do this is just you pair each page starting with the interior cover plus one page and count in doubles to ensure your double page art will be a two page spread, right? So you just got to map it out carefully to make sure that your double page spread is on two pages that open up <laughs> together because you can't have one and then it's flipped to the other side that, you know, that's not going to work logically. It has to, it has to actually, um, you know, go from side to side um, across two consecutive pages, you can't have a double page. It's like, oh, well, this page wraps around. It's like, that makes no sense because it's going on the other side. It's like, what? So you got to be careful. Um, and this is the double page uh, spread template. They have that there for you on Kablam. Um, so you can, uh, you, you know, use the double uh, page template. They specifically have a template for the double page. So use that, right? You actually use that template to do that spread. Um, and the same design cautions, of course, apply to that as well. Make sure your main artwork is in the live area, the blue area. Have the artwork extend all the way to the edges where things that are not as essential you know, could be potentially cut, but make sure the key elements are within the blue. File formatting, right? So on Kablam, um, Kablam is going to have specific technical specs that they, they want you to go over. So we'll read through this together and, and just go over it uh, on the technical side. And I'll explain or show some things uh, as we go along just to help you understand. So with the file format, um, you could build print-ready PDFs that you can send them. Um, I don't do that. I don't do the, the print-ready PDF, but you can send a PDF with all the pages collated. It's up to you. Um, they say they prefer the PDF flattened, but at the very least, be sure you've converted all fonts to curves or outlines and double check your export to PDF settings to be certain that the Create Acrobat uh, layers on export option is turned off. Um, they said, if you're not ready to build your own PDF, which I don't do again, you just send this, this, uh, the TIFF files for each page. That's what I do. So I save the pages as a TIFF file and um, they are flattened layers with no extra layers or channels. And they're saved using LZW compression. So LZW compression is lossless. So they, they have you compress the file here um, in, in the save so that way it takes up less space overall. Um, and the JPG, that is JPEGs, that's not what they want. They have to have uh, TIFFs. And they send. Um, they said they want their color files in RGB mode. Normally, CMYK is you know used sometimes in, in certain print formats, but RGB, most printers can deal with it, and their printers like RGB. So I keep mine in RGB, um, but they say if it's already in CMYK, you can just leave them that way. Don't convert them back. But you know, it's, it's really no big deal. Most people are going to be working that these days. Um, the resolution must be 300 dots per inch. So 300 DPI is the optimal resolution for a system. So if you don't understand these technical terms, maybe you're not Photoshop savvy yet, that's okay. It's something you learn as you learn about Photoshop. But basically, it's a concentration of the digital pixels, you can say, within an image. So there's 300 of these pixels, these little dots in an inch. Um, but that'll be something you learn more about as you study the basics of Photoshop. Dimensions, um, you know, the dimensions for each page... Um, obviously need to be lined up to those templates. Um, so there's there's nothing you need to, to uh, worry about if you actually make each page fit into those templates. So just use those templates on your actual files. Have your artist use those templates for it so you can actually visually see, oh, okay, the template's here. It's got the right DPI. It's got the right formatting. You're good to go. So just use the template over every page and you'll be good because we'll be able to check to make sure that it's in the right format. Uh, naming, that's uh, an interesting one. So they have a certain recommended naming, and I don't use it. Um, it's not that their naming is bad. I just think that my naming actually makes more sense and keeps things more organized. So they tell you, you know, you can name your your cover files like this, like A underscore front cover dot tiff, B underscore inside front, Y underscore inside back. Um, they tell you to like name your interior pages with just raw numbers like 001, 002, 003, just to keep it in order. And that's good. Uh, it definitely, you know, it keeps things in order for them, but I take a different approach that I think just makes a little bit more linear logical sense. So here's how I format it. So you can follow theirs, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to follow mine, I do the numbers plus names. And the reason why I do numbers plus names because then I can see exactly what's on the page and it's laid out, right? So if I have double O front cover, I know, oh, zero, zero, that's my front cover. That's the first thing that lines up. O1 interior cover. Oh, okay. O1, I know that's the interior cover because it's labeled. O2, sequential one. 
Now, again, when you sort these files, because you start with the number, they're going to stay in order, right? It's actually going to follow the, the, the numbered order. But by having the words with it as well, I know exactly what page it is. I know it's the first sequential. I know it's the second sequential. Then I know where it gets to 07 AN add one. Oh, that's my first ad page, right? So I prefer to do number plus a label that tells me exactly what it is so I can have that visual cue to know that everything's in its right place. Again, you don't have to do that, but I prefer to do that. And I've never, I've been printing with Kablam for over 10 years, never have had a problem with this system. And probably because I actually use numbers, you know, just like they do that lets them sort, you know, basically from first to last page, you know, it's going zero, 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 one. And of course you use three, if you have a larger comic book, you might need three numbers, but on a single issue, it's only 24 pages. So I can work with two digits. So. Um, this right here is just popping up the file saving in Photoshop. So I'm showing here that when you save as type uh, the TIFF file, it shows TIFF options. It says image compression, LZW, and it says discard layers and save a copy. So when you save as a TIFF for them, right, instead of doing the PDF, you choose the LZW and discard all layers. So just don't save this over your master file, save this independently. So again, this is just showing you what it's going to look like. Again, you're going to need to take basic Photoshop review just to understand the basics of Photoshop. Or unless you're somehow hiring someone who handles all this for you, I guess it's possible. But you should you should learn this basic <laughs> Photoshop skill of how to open and save a file. That would be very good and helpful. So this is just showing you what that looks like when you save it properly for Kabay. All right. Going into fulfillment. So fulfillment of your perks is incredibly important to get right as lost packages and broken items can cause a lot of frustration. If you follow my advice about keeping the perks simple and easy to ship in a flat mailer, you have a much easier time with your fulfillment. There are a few tips and tricks that can go a long way to help you succeed. First, before we get to fulfillment, update your backers. When the campaign closes, it's important to remind backers the next step on the campaign, right? So when you when your campaign closes, you should be telling them, hey, uh, funds will take a certain amount of time to disperse. On Indiegogo, it takes up to 15 business days. Um, you should be telling them you know, the timeline, reminding the timeline. Uh, reminding them to update their mailing address to you if they're going to be moving, right? You, if you're going to be taking up to a year to ship a comic, you might want to remind your backers, hey, by the way, update your address if you're going to move because it is a big amount of time. And I, and usually it's no problem these days. People are able to do that quickly and I've had no problem. Update backers with the key progress milestones with at least one update each month, right? You should maybe show off a pencil demo, maybe show a colored page panel, showing some lettering, whatever it is. You give them a little sneak teaser, keeps things exciting, keeps people wanting to, to support you because you're you're keeping them updated. When you're getting ready to get to fulfillment though, like when you're actually getting ready to mail stuff, update backers once again remind them to update the mail address if they are move, if they've moved or they're about to move, right? You should be sending this out at least a few weeks in advance so that people get have time to check their email and have time to sign in and update their um, email. So give them that heads up in advance and you'll save yourself a headache by not sending it to a place that someone's already moved from. For fulfillment, um, I typically have done fulfillment myself, and I do so by printing out the perks and donations claimed pages. So I, I print out the pages from Indiegogo, and I just work from that. Um, that is very basic, that, right? That that's like ground level one shipment option. It, you know, very uh, unsophisticated. So some people get more sophisticated and they use an export uh, the exported uh, Excel sheet to work from that is the CSV, the comma separated values from Indiegogo or their crowdsource fundraising platform. And then they work with that in a software to, you know, turn it into shipping labels. Again, that's, that gets a bit more technical um, and specialized. You would need some skills in Excel and that's, that goes beyond the scope of this. There, so there's some people who had many backers, like let's just say you have unprecedented success. Like you weren't expecting this. You get a thousand or more backers, right? At that point, you might want to use a third-party company like Easy Ship, which has Indigo integration. Um, again, because you could probably do up to a thousand. Many people probably could if they spend like, you know, every Saturday for four or five Saturdays doing 250 at a time. It's possible. It could be exhausting, but you know, it, it's doable as an individual. It's not the end of the world. But I don't think that for most people, their first campaigns, again, the most typical experience, you're not going to probably hit a thousand backers on your first campaign. You know, you, you're probably going to hit a couple hundred at most. Um, and, you know, you don't need to outsource that. And I, I really don't recommend outsourcing on your first campaign. And the reason why is you want to be personally overseeing the information, ensuring the quality control and keeping it in your hands. You know, outsourcing really is something out of necessity. 
and something that comes once you've developed a sense of how everything works. Um, or by, you know, maybe it just, you have a personal connection. Maybe you have, you know, somebody and they can help you out kind of thing, but by and large, you're, you're probably going to want to to do it yourself, at least in the first campaign. And for your typical comic mailer, um, a flat rate mailing envelope is going to suffice. Um, you know, you can get Gemini mailers that are boards like uh, comic boards, but I find that it tends to be more difficult to ship with that. And to you know have it packaged right, especially with additional items, um, it just can be a little bit easier for the first time just to use you know your your flat mailers and even sticking that into a flat rate envelope. So they're typically called you know nine by twelve inch document mailers or stay flats. These these documents, uh, document mailers, and in most cases it's going to be sufficiently sturdy to hold a comic book and smaller art prints, photos, stickers. Right, it's it's flat. You can stick all the stuff in there. Boom, you're good to go. It's going to stay strong, and you could slap on some do not bend stickers onto it. And you can even ship out some of these envelopes as oversized letters. So that's a cheaper option if they're, when they're under 13 ounces. If you do place a Do Not Bend sticker on them, then the price goes up because it converts to a package at UP, USPS if you're shipping to the USPS. Um, but this cost or risk calculation is going to be up to you, right? I've gotten to a point at this point now where I pretty much am shipping everything out with USPS flat rate mailers. And the reason why is I like... Um, the priority mail speed it comes with insurance, fifty dollars, and and tracking, and I can take my flat rate mailers and put them into the USPS things for extra protection. So it kind of just works out that way for me, um, but it's up to you. If you have several items to ship, especially multiple comics and things that are a little thicker, you may want to use a USPS flat rate mailer anyway, as you can stuff as much you can fit in there, and it will ship for one flat rate. Right, so the. You definitely want to do that if, if uh, you have like four or five comic books to send. Maybe you give someone some bonuses from other series or something or your crossover. I don't know. But um, if you don't do their flat rate, you'll be paying a lot more money. The flat rate mailer will save you some money. So it, it's just something to consider. I also place the comic and accessories in a thin paper protector sheet, like those plastic sheets that you had from school. Um to protect your class projects or whatever. Uh, it's cost effective way to keep the comic and materials from getting wet or scuffed, right? So just that little thin plastic sheet over everything extra, again, it, it takes away from scuffing. Um, it can help it. It's like somehow a raindrop gets on your package. It will keep it from getting wet inside the plastic to protect it. So it's a smart way to go. Um, I use the BCW comic book boards and sleeves for the comic itself. You can get those off Amazon or BCW supplies. Um, that's your typical uh, comic, you know, back, board, the whiteboard and a sleeve, right? So we'll get those boards. It'll give you a nice professional look for your comic. And then also put that all into a plastic sleeve and then into another protector. Again, the more protected it is, the more people are going to love you because their comic is coming to them without marks, without bends, without bends, without scuffing, right? Um, and again, calculate which perks require, which kinds of shipping op options. So you can price that accordingly, right? If you're just shipping out a sticker and, a, and you have a digital comic and sticker, obviously that's just a little flat envelope. But if you have a full printed comic, well, it's going to be a bigger envelope. Advanced logistics can come into play again if you are have the money, have the resources, and you're trying to get serious. Um, at, or by necessity, right? You get 1,500 backers, and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Okay, well, now you're, you're looking at next level shipping solutions. Um, the depth of the topic, though, is beyond the scope of this presentation. This presentation is meant for more newbies and people doing their first campaign kind of thing. Um, but I do have here, if you want to go uh, deeper, Easy Ship has a blog on advanced shipping solutions where they cover things like thermal label printing, sh their shipping software. They talk about you know crowdfunding um, issues and they have um, software solutions that integrates with Indiegogo. So again, if you're on Indiegogo, well, now you have someone that takes in those um, CSV or Excel files and helps you out there. Um, you can also check out stamps.com for discounted postage opportunities if you're looking to like just do postage at home potentially. And then I do want to give a shout out to criticalblast.com. So Critical Blast, um, they are a comic book shipping solution service. Uh, they do a lot of indie comics out there and um, that's someone who I've been on the show for. And it, it's a, a potential solution for you if you're like, oh, okay, I'd like someone else to do the shipping so I don't have to. And you want something that is you know more personalized custom service, Critical Blast is someone to look at. Again, they have their own uh, conversion software and stuff like that, so they can take your Excel sheet and do the shipping for you, and you would send your perks to them, and they would take care of fulfillment. Again, something to consider, especially if you're maybe on the edge, maybe you got 500 backers or more, and you're like, ah, I don't really want to do shipping. Again, you're going to pay for it, but 
um, you'll get that done for yourself. But again, smaller projects, first time, do it yourself, get a sense of things. You have an understanding of how things go, you get a sense of prices, and then maybe check out um, Critical Blast or Easy Ship if you're getting you know, to that level. A thank you letter. Thank you letters are important to add. You want to thank your backers inside your mailer. It's a great time to let them know how much you appreciate them and their support. Um, you don't have to make a custom top to bottom letter. You can, you can have like a, a, a pre-printed like Word document body and then you fill in their name personally or if you want to add a little extra note by hand, you know, especially if someone you know or someone who's been a, a backer of other stuff, you know, a custom message goes a long way. So, you know, I'd like to add little messages here and there, uh, especially if someone I know are met. Um, but a thank you letter, again, is, is great. Let's the, the backers know that you care. And also you could, it's an opportunity to, to pitch your next, pro, next project. If you have, you know, your stuff being shipped out and you're like, oh, hey, check out our website. We're about to do another campaign. Then you have a way to get people to come on back. Your return address labels. So again, if you're doing your shipping yourself, you know, it's a smaller project. You have a few hundred most uh, people. You could save a lot of effort using pre-made return address labels. You could pick them up at one of the services mentioned earlier, like Amazon or Vistaprint, right? These are just like your little pre-printed, hey, you know, return back to me or whatever uh, if this bounces. Um, the cost of each is in the sense when you get these. It'll give you a package of professional look, right? To have a nice little gold or silver pre-printed name in your home address or business address up top in case there's a return package. So simple thing that goes a long way to give, give that nice professional feel. I didn't use to do this in the beginning. I regret it. Later on, I did. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is so much better just to be able to stick a, a sticker on for my return address, right? Marking off completion. Um, so again, this is the uh, very bare bones, simplistic version of completion. This is where I'm printing out my backers, uh, perk selection and their addresses just from the sheets. I'm just printing out of my printer. Nothing too crazy. Uh, I note down there um, what it is that I'm working on using uh, labels and highlighters. So um, I work by lowest level perk up to the highest. So in other words, the perks that have the fewest op options and, and accessories, the ones that have the most. And I do these, you know, in batches where I, I work through the sheet and I use I use highlighter to mark each perk. So I'm like making sure, okay, here's the people that have backed with just the comic. Here's the people that have backed with the comic plus you know, the bookmark, whatever. And um, that lets me just kind of go through and mark off what I've done and, and what I still need to do. So again, very simple. Not, you know, this is not too technical. Anybody could pretty much do it. Um, and it makes it more accessible for first time people. And again, when, when you get more advanced, if you start to get some real success, then you can, you know, have a, a digital system that's handling this or, or a separate uh, service provider. But at the beginning, you know, if you're just starting off and you're like, Hey, I got a hundred backers in my campaign. Woo. I, you know, I did it. You know, this is a quick way to kind of work your way through fulfillment when you're shipping off things. So once you've shipped out your perks, you should definitely update your backers that you've done. So letting them know, you know, that, uh, you should probably see your perk within two weeks. Usually that's US side. International could take longer, but you know, sometimes shorter just depends on where how far it's going. Um, you should definitely let them know to reach out to you if they don't see anything within three weeks, 30 days. So that way if something got lost, you don't have an angry customer. Uh, you want them to to tell you right away, hey, my package didn't come here. It's been four weeks, right? That way you can go check out the tracking number or whatever. And usually by and large, it's just best to replace a backer's missing perk right away. You're gonna you're gonna win hearts and minds just by replacing a perk, and not you know holding up on that. You know if it gets lost, just do it. It's worth it for the long term. Um, you know the the benefits of being prompt and professional is going to build trust that lasts far beyond your campaign. So you know don't try to be a stickler about it. Be like, oh, let me see if it's really lost. This or that. If you see, yeah, it's not moving or it's it's, it's not going. It's you know maybe lost. Then just just go ahead and replace it. All right, and with that, you've made it. If you made it to the end of this presentation, congrats. You now have an excellent beginning framework to develop your comic book project by. So uh, thank you so much for sticking it out. I know this was a very long presentation, but how else am I going to teach you all the, the ropes? I mean, there's a lot that goes on in, in comic production. It's no easy thing, and it's kind of weird to go through all this step-by-step <laughs> step, you know, for, for the bulk of what it takes to produce do some comic. I mean, it's kind of incredible. I've been doing this for over 10 years and I've had so many learning lessons and so many you know, adjustments and, and uh, uh, things I've had to adapt to. So it feels kind of cool to be able to summarize this for you. But I wanted to pay it forward from the people who have helped me and, and to try to help you all be able to be successful in your own 
uh, projects and creations. So if you would like a special consultation or tailored advice, um, I am available for hire as a comic production consultant. You can email me at mr.voluntary at gmail.com. So I do do that. If you uh, need some help, you're like, hey, I, I want to you know, figure out how to best frame my initial RFP, or you want to talk about what could make sense for shipments, I can definitely uh, do that as a for hire comic production consultant. Um, so definitely uh, feel free to reach out. And if uh, you also uh, have the time, check out my comic book series, uh, Volcomic dot com need a voluntary it's the name of comic book series but v-o-l-c-o-m-i-c.com volcomic.com is where you can check that on out i greatly appreciate it and if you just happen to love this presentation and want to support uh, my next campaign uh, i would be very honored and I, I would definitely love that um so good luck to you on your project um i hope that this uh, presentation is inspiring for you and that it uh really gives you a sense of, of what it takes to get things done and hopefully you feel also less overwhelmed uh, too, because I know for me, it was like overwhelming at first to really deal with all these things and be like, oh, okay, wow, there's so much, you know, so much to do and think about and to be careful of, but hopefully you can avoid the pitfalls that I, you know, that I followed into and, and my mistakes and you have like a, be a best presentation as possible and, and, and really be able to wow people with your project. So, all right, take care everybody. And I'll talk to you soon.